Um, I'm delighted to welcome everyone here today. It's an incredible opportunity to review some of the approaches that were kind of contained within the school last year. So this is work that was completed at the end of last year from all across the school, from uh, second and third year, from first year, from some of the graduate programs, from um, technical studies, etc. So it's a, a sort of a broad spectrum, perhaps a sort of sectional cut through what was happening in the school really at the end of, uh, of last year. And it's an opportunity because obviously these moments are quite tricky. It's work that's been finished. It's been, you've stepped away from it, maybe happily, maybe, maybe with regret. Um, but there's sort of little opportunity to return to it, make those amendments unless you're super keen and it's an ongoing passion. So I think today is really an opportunity for us to talk about maybe also what's important within architectural education, how we're approaching it through the school, how the different units have taken on different questions, and how those things have been realized at a moment of transition between the years of, of COVID and isolation and kind of purely digital production and a return to the school. So I'm delighted to have all of you here. I can do um, some brief introductions. We have Roz Barr, who has taught in the school for, for many years, some years ago. I don't know if, if yeah. you wanted to say a couple words. Um, about I taught on, uh, on in, uh, in intermediate with Stefan Roberti Pansera, who's no longer here either. And then I was external examiner here for five years with you, actually. Yeah. So, yes, thanks for inviting me. It's great to have you back. Yeah, it's good to be back. Um, uh, Nick Simchik, um, down for, well, on sabbatical from Cambridge this year, but also um, a, a, an AA graduate from a couple of years ago. Yeah, I uh, lecture in architecture and studies in Cambridge. I run the MPhil and Urban Studies, which is kind of a history and theories MPhil. I did Dip 10, uh, and that led me to anthropology. Fantastic. Um, I don't know if you have access to a microphone over there. Oh, we'll move it closer to you. Yeah, go. I think it's a live mic, Mary. It's not good. That's good. So I'm Mary Duggan. Uh, experience in teaching sort of splattered over 10, 15 years includes um, UCL, Oxford Brooks, and briefly Kingston last year. And I run my own small practice, Mary Duggan Architects. Thanks, Mary. Um, Pierre Davoin. Um, I'm delighted to be invited to teach um, Diploma 14 at the AIR this year. Um, I taught here 20 years ago in first year, and before that in, in Diploma. I also run a small practice in London. Uh, yeah, thank you. Hello, uh, this is Takeshi Hayatsu. Uh, I graduated in 1997, so it's a pleasure to be back to see <laughs> yes. what's going on now. <laughs> yes, <exactly. laughs> yes, yeah. Uh, in terms of teaching, I teach at Kingston University, and uh, yeah, yes. I'm Elliot Rogerson, and I just started teaching intermediate this year here, <coughs> intermediate 12. Yeah. Fantastic. And um, sitting to your left is Mike Ayling, who joins us as the Deputy Head of Teaching and Learning. Uh, if you want to, and um, we skipped over Mark Morris, who is a familiar face to all of you, who is the Head of Teaching and Learning. Um, Mark, would you like to also add any comments? Because you were the master of ceremonies for this, this work that was produced last year. It was an interesting year. It was hybrid year. But it was one where, after coming out of a previous year of all digital, there was an interesting embrace, or tentative embrace, of things tactile and model. So I expect we'll be seeing a bit of that today. Um, yeah, and it was an amazing year too, because I think in coming back, we all learned to sort of appreciate this place and each other in a different way. Uh, but the work, our external examiners commented on the work as being some of our strongest. I don't know how that happened, but um, I think we made the best of a difficult situation. And it's great to look at this work because in that way Ingrid set up that rear view mirror stuff, we rarely do, but you have just enough critical distance, I would imagine, that it's an interesting conversation today. Fantastic. Um, Mike, it's such, a, it's such a joy to kind of welcome you to the school. Obviously this is uh, an opportunity. For, for you to, and please do, yeah, I don't want you to be. Hello everyone, I just wanted to do a mic check to see if it was picking up from about there actually. Um, so, um, feedback. hello everyone, I am the new Deputy Head of Teaching and Learning. I've been here for one month and one day. So um, it's fascinating to be involved in the school and this is actually a really uh, interesting way of, of 
learning place. Um, I was an external as well, so that's been my kind of um, perspective of the place so far. So yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. So, over to you. Um, if you want to say just a little bit about, you know, also what you're doing now out of curiosity. So if you want to introduce yourself and just tell us a little bit about, you know, what, what you were doing last year and maybe what you're doing now. Um, so my name is Gal. Um, I uh, started actually my first degree in Israel in the Technion. And I came... Use the microphone please. Okay. <laughs> Um, and I came to the AA last year um, to the um, um, unit uh, Experimental 14 with uh, Chris Pearson and Dean and Aram. And um, basically um, it was a lot about um, tradition, identity, material. Um, and I, I liked very much the experimental part when you actually do it with your hands. And uh, it was um, a lot of hours uh, in the workshop in the DPL, and I think it's also like connected what what like you said like earlier that it's like really exciting moment where this transition like back to the hands-on work. Um, so for me, it was an amazing year. Um, this year, I'm doing a deep four. Um, uh, with John and Anne Sophie, uh, like very different, <laughs> but I'm really excited. Um, yeah, so uh, maybe I'll start. Great. Um, um, so, as you can see, I had an obsession with seaweed uh, last year.
yellowish um, color uh, mm -hmm. or a bit less uh, green. Did, um, did you invent that mix by yourself or you borrowed from somebody? Yes. Are you this your yes. <laughs> recipe? Idea. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh -huh. um, because uh, I know a few other applications see we to use for the building materials or building mm -hmm. uh, you know application not necessarily structural. Mm -hmm. but yeah. Uh, I don't know, it seems that you start with a mix and then carry it out, but there are other ways to use that. For example, there's a vernacular building in mm -hmm. somewhere in, in Scandinavia company, c c country, for example, uses a mm -hmm. thatch. Yes, mm -hmm. I know. Uh, I think this is like using, uh, they use the more like raw um, uh, um, material, mm -hmm. not as a mix. I, this is what, from what I read. Um, yeah, but maybe that's a really good moment to sort of open the conversation because obviously there's a decision that you've made to create a, a compound that enables you to treat it as a uniform, as a paste, you know, as one yeah. would actually with concrete yeah. or yeah. with um, something that becomes a more uniform material that requires a substructure or whatever mm. it may be to operate. <laughs> mm. When actually there's a, a difficult perhaps conversation around where natural materials dictate architectural form so they detect a kind of a thinness or a thickness and I'm kind mm -hmm. of curious because obviously we have a lot of different people here mm -hmm. who have very different experience of that mm -hmm. um, mode of, of operation whether there's uh, an attraction two, two, yeah two points really I mean I thought it's a lovely presentation I, I really like the, the, the two screens and mm -hmm. the process going on but the, the first one I wanted to make is a point about collaboration this, this is this kind of endeavor is, is kind of intensively and extensively collaborative, it seems to me, to, to get anywhere in this process. And it would be really interesting to acknowledge, you know, who are the players in this conversation. That, that would be one thing, I, I think, really interesting for me. But the other thing is about the temporal and, 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 and the, 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 the it seems like this is quite perishable yeah. at the moment, which I think yeah. is fine. But the implication there is that it requires extensive maintenance and, mm. and, and, and a different kind of mindset for the, um, mm. you know, the, the, the building process, the, the way you live mm. in somewhere, and the way you keep attending to it. You know, mm. it's, and that, that's a, in, mm. really interesting, mm. <laughs> given that you know, we, we are always sold, you know, fixes that, mm. you know, it's, it, it, that, you know there, there's no kind of, you don't need to go back to it if you, or, you know, the idea that you get rid of the product once it's, it's reached its short shelf mm. life. But mm. I, I, it's just, yeah. I'm just offering that as a thing. I was thinking of the, I think, the Diane Mosk in Nari, you know, the, the, the moss that's built with clay and once a year, it gets maintained, it's, it's made of a very, very um, malleable substance and it just deteriorates because of the weather. Mm -hmm. And every year the whole community comes together and they go through a process of repairing it. And it's repaired with um, timber, and the timber is staked into the surface of the moss to enable the community to climb and add more of this kind of door material to repair it. So I was thinking along the yeah. same side, you know, who are the, mm. like, who are the stakeholders in this? Kind of longer term, you know, is it something that is repairable? And because it's repairable mm. and it does dematerialize, that's a positive thing that mm. makes it mm. a material that is a continuum but through an additional mm. human active engagement. Mm. Um, the other comment I just think, and maybe just sorry to be a practitioner now, but you know, in the world of architecture, what I really love about what you've done is you've perceived one material and you've looked at all of its characteristics, you know, how it can be a solid material, how it can glue other materials together and how it can mend and repair. And we just don't do that. We, we make multiple buildings out of multiple materials and we get them costed and then we make other ones and it's iterative and kind of demoralising and I think we're all hoping that at some point we'll be able to deploy a really positive process which is born out of 
thinking laterally about materials and designing with them mm -hmm. to make the buildings in a completely different way. Um, but yeah, congratulations. I think it's been a really amazing bit of research and design at the same time. Mm -hmm. In terms of tradition, sorry, um, do you know Japanese seaweed plaster? Uh, it's called shikui. It's a tradition used uh, sort of mix. They mix with lime and seaweed, the boiled seaweed. So what it does is uh, the seaweed, a certain type of seaweed is used as a glue. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, once it's boiled, you extract the, the sort of the, the, the compound from that and then mix with the lime. And then some have, have a kind of chemical reaction to it, making the the plaster harder mm -hmm. and stronger, so they use for the you know the kind of fire protection and, mm -hmm. um, uh, and also it's sort of kills slowly. So therefore, you can actually do a lot of the ornament while mm -hmm. it's dry. Mm -hmm. So there's sort of quite you know craft skills developed mm -hmm. in that mm -hmm. uh, special mix, mm -hmm. which is very interesting. It's actually the same kind of seaweed you can get from British coast. Mm -hmm. So yeah, mm. we actually try to do that workshop next oh, spring to, to actually do that. Mm -hmm. But anyway, yeah, so yes, it's the fragility and the maintenance is mm. one, but also actually using some <coughs> other way you can make a very durable, yeah. strong material. Mm. Sorry. I mean, I just have three things to say. I mean, I'm Quite impre I'm impressed with your material experiments, and I know how difficult it is to work with a robot. <laughs> so, <laughs> congratulations on managing to do this, and doing, managing to do something with this. Um, but to bounce on, on, maybe on this question, is that in, I mean, in the UK, seaweed is not really appreciated, like in Japan, for example. Mm -hmm. So I don't, yeah, I, I just wondered what you thought about how people, what people think about. How would you change people's minds about seaweed in the UK almost before going into like a, making a factory or this kind of project? I wonder, like in, in the UK culture, like how you would actually change people's minds about seaweed? Because it's not the same as in other countries. And, um, and also, maybe, I guess we talked about the workshop that we're having. We're inviting two people to come and talk in a few weeks in, in our unit, but you could join if you want. We have someone working, the uh, head of design at Notplan. I guess you looked at their work. She's coming to design to talk about how she experiments with materials. Mm -hmm. and, and someone else from another startup in London called Shellworks. They work more with microbes. Mm -hmm. uh, so the mm -hmm. head of design is also coming, so mm -hmm. he might be interested in coming. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, um, what I'm about to say is meant as a compliment. Um, I find it wonderfully monstrous as a material. It's got this <laughs> quality, um, and I think it's because it's fundamentally alive, which is strange and weird and eerie. Um, even when it sets, it seems to be in a type of liquid state, so it's, it's kind of always transitional. And I think that, again, is a kind of monstrous thing. And the fact it can operate as a material in itself and a type of glue, as a wider agent. Mm. The thing, the way it can bring things together is mm. against monsters. And so that's really an observation. I'd be, if you were to continue this research in the future, and you know, it seems like there's lots of avenues in which this could go, one thing I was curious about would be how it might work in tension. So the column suggests some kind of compressive force mm. being made through it. But if it has this very short life cycle, and just put it into a kind of a situation where it adds a whole tension, how it might become a sacrificial, how these things might die and then have to be replaced, could be an interesting kind of experiment. Um, the other thing I wanted to just pick up on, again, if you were to take this forward, and I'm not suggesting to, it just seems incredibly interesting, are the other type of phenomenal effects that this might produce in a building in an environment. So are there will it change the way one feels in a space beyond the aesthetic? So are there mm. certain kind of sense that this gives? The sensorial kind of implications. Is this something about the level of salt that affects the way you taste in, in a room? Mm. Well that kind of coming into a kind of phenomenological position on it. But 
there are things beyond itself that can build material I think are incredibly interesting and the monsters might be a way of exploring it aesthetically but there are other kind of yeah, some sort of implications on that. Could I pick up on that comment actually? Is that, well, yeah, because no, because there's it's so interesting because the um, and also as a the aesthetic questions and the technical questions are I think kind of not accidentally related, right? So I I was delighted to hear you mention Ruskin, right? But then there's this kind of Ruskin meets H.R. Geiger in Alien kind of thing, which can go to and also like Gak in the like slime in the '90s Nickelodeon thing, right? Which is which can kind of become sort of a dystopian. Uh, craft future, which is the kind of Ruskin version, or it can be like a plausible utopian future, which is a kind of morris -y version maybe. So the questions of, you know, who's doing this and what the means of production are and how people are coming together to make it are somehow embedded, are not really entirely resolved and that's okay, right? But, but they're somehow embedded in the aesthetic somehow, right? Like you're, within the aesthetic questions you're asking yourself are also the issues of how is it going to be made? What is the kind of aesthetic manifestation of the production, of the craft production, and then also how is it going to be sold, right? How do you, how do you kind of deliver it? Is it, is it a dystopian Scottish H.R. Geiger 90s? I mean, it's also kind of Balenciaga spring, summer 22, 23, like walking in the mud, which is invoking dystopian 90s, ironically, but you see what I'm saying? Like, so it's, you actually have a decision to make, if it's Ruskin or if it's Morris, in a way. Um, and the way it looks and the way it's made are linked, so, yeah. When it took its mold, that was very moist, right? Um, and there's something about, the, I think the temporary is all right. I mean, it's, we're trying to source a curtain for the AAIS program. And one of the things that's come up is uh, color of the curtain, this would shift color, um, and the acoustic properties. And I'm really curious, Mike asked about certain uh, other sort of sensoria around this, but my guess is this has an interesting acoustic quality. Um, and I think to go back to the, to the research, there was something so smart about this compound becoming that joint, that cartilage joint, mm -hmm. in a wider system that seemed utterly convincing. So I think if there was a kind of high point in the work, it was finding that, which was not a total rising system, but you, you found the strategic point where it would, would work in a, mm. in a hybrid system. And I, mm. I thought that was really adventurous and, a, and an interesting part of where the research took you because you were so <laughs> crystal clear about the material, but you were open to where it could fit and how it might function. Mm. Thank you. I mean, there's some fantastic points that have, have been picked up. Um, I think some of this actually also echoes a little bit of what Mary had to say. You know, there's, there's also something extraordinary about you know, be, being able to focus on this one material um, that you're telling quite a deep story that I, you know, I have this map in front of me and the idea that the, the kind of the labor also of, of Edinburgh ends up in the sea itself. So the act of flooding then becomes an opportunity to make the factory the sea. And um, there's some extraordinary aspects to that. I suppose there's, it's such a, a wonderful project in that it's, a, it's an uncontrollable entity that you sort of decided to embrace that, that you've drawn in this highly precise way. And to me, I think yesterday someone dropped by and he said, you know, the wonderful thing about the AA is that it's always had a good sense of humor. And I think there's something quite funny about taking something that's, you know, the blob or the slime and then articulating that as a kind of restricted, technologically advanced, highly uh, kind of analytical process that evolves into these very beautiful drawings. That's a little bit like, you know, how we understand and a technological process and that it's it's both a, a kind of a leap of the imagination and something that requires quite a playful level of investigation so I think it's like poise in a wonderful place always there's this moment where you say like god if you had like a whole other year then then it's like you know this whole idea that this is a whole study of time and you know different cycles of decay and different depths of the material and then you know this sort of evocation of the en nouveau where actually this is this is a growing object and what is coming out of this thing does it have a second life where it actually starts to create new life 
probably mold, I'm afraid, <laughs> but um, <laughs> maybe that's good. And, um, and it becomes interwoven with its different stages of production. Mm -hmm. And then you reinvent the arts and crafts, but only through seaweed. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's kind of fantastic. And then we have to accept along the lines of Mali that things will just need repair. Yeah. This is something that we've kind of forgotten and is so critical to how we understand the next mm -hmm. half century at least of, you know, how do we, how do we retrofit, how do we amend, how do we move forward, how do we accept, how we develop a kind of resilience that is about you know, adaptation. So it's, it's a fantastic thing that works across a really wonderful range of scales, both of time and place. So it's, it's a wonderful piece of work. You kind of allude to something almost primordial. <coughs> you know, that, that a man comes out of the sea and man <coughs> returns <coughs> to this, this sort of <coughs> semi-aquatic state, but I'm, I'm just wondering that, you know, I'd, I'd love to see a, a kind of a playful drawing mm. that might discuss all of this as a kind of, what are the limitations and, and, and what are the kind of, um, what are the adaptations that happen to man himself or mankind, mm -hmm. you know, just in terms of how that might change the way we we exist, I think. Mm. I mean, you, you could be really quite, you know, mm. wildly speculative, I feel, because mm. this is underpinned by such, you know, serious good stuff. Yeah. What is the machine-human interface is a really important question for you, for, like, the future of digital craft, right? Like, to go, I think, to pick up on that, I think, right? Like, how do, how do humans interact with the machine? Yeah. Is it a lot of people? How does the creative workflow happen? <laughs> And maintenance. Yeah, mm -hmm. so to pick up on Ingrid's point, I don't necessarily think you should be an apologist for saying mm -hmm. materials are going into neat maintenance. This is a difficult challenge. It's an environmental challenge. It's a social challenge. Um, I don't think you need to say, well, okay, I need to kind of refine this so it becomes mm -hmm. another material that you can get off the shelf and that's so kind of, mm -hmm. I mean, in reality, yes, in the immediate future. But the idea that we're going to have to engage with materials in a, a much more complex temporal way. It's, it's not something to be afraid of, I think. Mm. I think it's, mm. it's a challenge we have to kind of grapple. Mm. Mm. <coughs> is it something that you would continue? Because you're in diploma now, aren't you? And is this something that you could take forward? Because I think this research is so important and it, and it is endemic in what we do as practitioners. You know, we'd spend years looking at certain materials and then never having the opportunity to actually build with them. You know, so you have all this stored knowledge that you kind of carry with you and it moves on to another project and then you realize it in another, it, it, it sometimes appears in, you know, maybe 10 years forward from where you were before. And I know within my practice, we, we spend a lot of time researching and making and prototyping and then it kind of sits somewhere in a cupboard or on a shelf somewhere. But I think because of the amount of work that you've done here and because of you know, the possibilities that we can see, and I think this process of making is so important to understand and it would be wonderful if, you know, especially if you've stayed at the AA from undergraduate to postgraduate, that you, know, you could sort of expand on that knowledge and actually have an opportunity because materials, identity, placemaking is, is all interwoven and you've got a real sort of chance here to sort of show us how this could appear again or apply it to another project. Um, if you're allowed to. Yeah. You can do what you I like. Mean, in my mind, I, I really want to. Yeah. Um, then I, I mean, I started the year by like saying, okay, I have this material, mm. and maybe um, more like um, uh, logis logistically mm -hmm. and like um, uh, in the social, you know, mm. uh, aspect, um, and maybe even economical aspect how it works, mm -hmm. uh, because this is also things that are depends on the possibility of these materials. Mm -hmm. Like not only develop them in, mm -hmm. in the lab, but also to to realize like how um, yeah I, I think like um, how it's possible like in those terms as well, mm -hmm. like, logistically and more pra practically. Mm -hmm. uh, it might be like very you know, um, like take, taking the dream like down, mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe, but maybe it's like down to earth. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I, I'm like really, um, 
I will be really excited to continue. Yeah, I think yeah. it would be good to see. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we'll have to call you back at the end of the year. <laughs> it's just like, I think there's like this wonderful possibility that no, but I think you know, Div, Div 4 has always been, or for the last few years, it's really it's also this work that John and Sophia have done about oceans. So much of their work has to do with the you know the edges and boundaries of these conditions, be them natural or be they political. And this is kind of exactly the condition that you found, where actually you know, this has become, that edge has become a place of production because of the problems of climate change. So, you know, it's, it, there is a moment there that actually becomes rehearsed from a different perspective or at a different scale as you move forward this year. So uh, maybe, maybe this is your area of expertise. Gal, Mrs. Seaweed. <laughs> this is my name already in this <laughs> Seaweed girl. <laughs> seaweed girl. You've got the label. Um, the other, what I was going to ask, to, I think mm. something Moss was saying, is that there is a kind of, I think, keenness around the table because I, I think you can develop this quite quickly. You know, everything is very slow because it happened, all the kind of design energy is at undergraduate diploma level, and then things do when you take them into practice, they do just sit on the shelf because you just don't get the opportunity to explore quickly. And I just wonder if you were to, to turn this into 10 projects, mm -hmm. and one might be 10 students in wages trying to build something in the ocean slowly, somehow. Mm -hmm. Another one might be the, a component goes to an engineering department and they do those technical things like structural testing and, mm -hmm. and other stuff to make it work, make it a block or make it something else. And another bit might test the material as a, a mortar or mm -hmm. something. And, and things can happen quite quickly. Mm -hmm. And then you might find you've got a very different project made of this material. Mm -hmm. But there's a kind of um, interesting in, in sharing this knowledge, you know. I mean, I mean it, when you started talking to this, it made me think of Mrs. Code who was invented code stone back in the 18th century, you know, the, 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 the mixture for making these kind of neoclassical ornaments was, was a protected recipe and, and exclusive and in a way your recipe is something that should be shared and, and, mm. and, and mm. developed, you know, um, collaboratively and, and, and I think that's the kind of spirit mm -hmm. I get from the project. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Oh, fantastic. I think we should probably move move on. Thank you so much. I think it's a, a wonderful conversation, both you know, history, collaboration, materiality, fabrication. So it's fantastic. Thanks for also thanks for kicking us off. Yes. <laughs> fantastic. Well, are we ready to go? You're partly online and, um, and yeah. partly in person, which seems tremendously appropriate for this moment in the world. <laughs> um, so, but if you'd like to introduce yourselves, um, yeah. that would be one fantastic. Also, where you are and what you're doing. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. We are we're a platform team. Um, we graduated from the RL in uh, last January. Um, from Daphne, Ulla, and Yuji is with us from yeah. China. <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> what time is it there? <laughs> uh, it's, yeah, it's the time. Yes, okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Um. Yeah, so we are currently working, we graduated from January, so we are now working and working with foster partners yeah. and with Ula. Yeah, I'm working with Zaha Hadid, architect. Oh, I'm working with Zaha Hadid, architect. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Thanks so much. Well, um, off, you, off you go, however you choose to do this combined presentation. All right. Um, thank you for inviting us. Um, so, uh, Cloud Forma um, was a thesis presented at the DRL, and we were part of um, Theodore Spiracle Studio. And the theme at the time was um, the elemental. And as a team, we um, explored the element of water. So, water is a phase change material, and this unique transformative quality was the aspect of our uh, research. Water touches every aspect of our lives. It inhabits the, the Earth's surface, be it oceans, lakes, rivers, and the atmosphere. We're always surrounded by water droplets. Um, although dominant, water is finite. 
Um, so, as we know, two billion of the world population live in water scarce um, areas. In our thesis, we respond to climate change, where the risk of drought is um, significantly intensified. We notice that um, arid regions are suffering, uh, but they're still planned as on, on an old architectural paradigm, and the approach <clears throat> does not serve specific climatic context. Therefore, there's a need to increase regional adaptability. We drew inspiration from the likeness of nature and water's radical properties, seeking to transfer that to a decentralized strategy. Um, so Cloudforma harnesses the cloud as an infrastructure and aims to create what we call an augmented weather system. So our role is to orchestrate the timing of events towards a system that is ver as versatile as the weather. Um, the augmented weather system employs a machine learning strategy enabling a feedback loop with the environment. The system is driven by goals. So we setting up a meaningful data set strategy is crucial. The data set includes four main layers. The first, a map of places in need, which defines the goal. The goal represents uh, the relationship um, that the system wants to have with its environment. The humidity data map indicates possible locations of harvesting. Wind is uh, used to, as the main resource that the agents would sail on to reach their goal. And <clears throat> it gives the altitude and uh, direction of traveling. And finally, the topography and hydrology maps were used as, uh, for navigation. You can speak up if you just still on screen. Um, yeah, you can speak about this part if you can see the text. Uh, the process includes data collection from net data that are used to create agent in our system, and uh, we select three scenarios as case study: Yemen, uh, Nevada, and Chile. So we are moving forward explaining how our system uh, principles and agents are const uh, constantly part of the atmosphere. Wind patterns in the atmosphere change direction across different altitudes. The agents take advantage of this to sail the wind and we design a balloon capable of moving upward or downward to catch a favorable wind direction. And in our machine learning experiments, it becomes clear that as the chaining happens from uh, left to right, the percentage of success increases. test with some physical experiments. So our material is the atmosphere. The material tests focused on the understanding of the smoke behavior. And in our physical experiments, we test how temperature acts as a control parameter. Two mean behaviors emerged. Uh, one agents appear, oh. Sorry about the accident. <laughs> Um, basically, we are like trying to use uh, uh, dry ice as a material and medium to test out the fl uh, fluidity of the uh, like uh, b between like uh, units and uh, try to control the flow by uh, I mean control control the um, 
the, the form or the, sh or the fluidity through certain parameters as uh, such as temperatures and the cold, uh, cold temperature and hot temperature where I exchange the, uh, the kind of the results or the recording in, in certain moments. So we are quite trying to exploring and testing out them and <laughs> yep, yeah. yeah. Um, so, should I continue with this? Uh, I don't know what's going on. Yeah, it's fine. Sorry. Is it not responding? Yeah. Um, yeah, probably we need to fix this. So otherwise, you can't see the, <laughs> the test results. Sorry about this. I'm going to just ask a couple questions while you sort this okay. out. Yeah. This one probably not. Um, I mean, obviously, this is incredible. Obviously, it's a fantastic um, combined work. I'm curious. It might you might need to sort of explain in very simple terms. I mean, how do we control these atmospheres? How do we, you know? Uh, uh, what is what is the mechanism by which you can start to really manipulate the weather? Sort of in layman's terms, as they say, whether we, uh, we can shall we? Uh, yeah, continue? we can continue yeah. Go ahead. because it, it explains the process. <laughs> yeah. okay. Okay. We apologize for the technical. <laughs> okay, sorry. So continue with this experiments. Um, the two mean behavior emerged. Warming agents appeared. To attract the uh, uh, to attract the while the cold ones repel, and uh, yeah, uh, so so we transferred our observation into the digital two D space, setting up the simulations framework, and we set up a simulation guided by the temperature field, as a result um, diagrams you can see. And we end up get uh, setting the three fields that trigger clouds uh, formation, temperature, velocity, and density field. Uh, these fields are controlled by two agents populations. The output the output of, is evaluated based on three properties. Um, so our clouds have three main properties: water content coverage, cloud coverage, and the albedo. Cloud coverage and albedo are the properties that are related to the solar geoengineering aspect of the project. Meaning, can we engineer the microclimate? For example, can we mitigate conditions of extreme heat? Um, since albedo shows the percentage of reflectivity of sun and cloud coverage shows how much shade the cloud can provide. Um, by programming our agent behavior, we control the emergence of different cloud types with different qualities. And as a result, we conclude on different cloud morphologies based on va variating agent populations and different environmental con conditions, as we show in the table here in the catalog. So moving closer to the agent scale, there are two populations that are represented by two types, the transport agent and the hygroscopic agent. The transport agent harvests solar energy to remain buoyant. When humidity is above 70%, the hair on its surface expands and it activates the release of the condensation agents. The condensation agent attracts water with its hygroscopic hair that exists on its surface and triggers condensation to happen. Our agents constantly sail the winds, seeking for moisture through adjusting their flight altitude. They're constantly receiving real-time data and sense humidity. From the high resolution of the weather scale, we're moving to the low resolution of a single agent. The agent travels by harnessing the favorable wind while it receives data in real time, senses changes in its environment, that facilitate its navigation. When it finally reaches a place of high humidity, it releases a population of agents 
which are triggering condensation. So water has been at the core of our settlements. The level of control over water resources and management reflects the advancement of a society. What we formulate through our research is an augmented weather system that enables life conditions in places where water is scarce. We are trying to uncover the invisible We proposing, well, by proposing a hybridized ecology between humans and infrastructure. So cloud forma is related to the very substance of water and emphasizes our connection with the physical resources in the most primal sense. Thank you. Can I turn to you, Nick? Yeah, uh, wow, I mean, amazing amount of work. We're, uh, we're fully playing God here, yeah. which exposes you to all the possible critiques of God, <laughs> which is a difficult position to be in. So uh, I admire your, uh, your courage to go there, uh, in a sense, um, because morality, um, you know. Well, I was curious if you didn't mention climate change once. We did. did you? We did. Okay, okay, did. so, so, okay. I mean, right. it all revolved around actually, like, Like fixing it, it. right, yeah. so, okay. Uh, not fixing it, but addressing it, trying to th figure out a way to... Yeah. Play with Beyond, existing yeah. conditions, rather than... We, we, we notice how, actually, cities in the arid regions, like <coughs> Saudi cities, for example, yeah, are yeah. built based on the Western paradigm. Right, right. It does not serve the specific climatic context of living in the desert, living in an arid place. Um, so we, we actually wanted to address how can we use the conditions themselves. Like there is a huge, like there, we had, we did a lot of research. research. It's a that very we, that yeah. we didn't, yeah, yeah, we didn't have time to talk. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's an incredible, it's, it's like a movie, like it's incredible. Um, um, the question is, do you want it to be a movie or not, right? This is, I think, a delicate, important question that you have to ask yourselves. Like, are we actually playing God? Are we not? Um, but, but and totally unrelated, like as a kind of person with a background in anthropology, I think of rain dances, I think of like, again, God, I mean, all the things that humans do to try to change the weather already. Um, and, and then actually the infrastructures that people build, like rain catching devices exactly. in the Sahara yeah. and stuff like that. Um, and then how those are all deeply ritualized. So that there's a whole kind of incredible <laughs> version of this story that, that, that enters the way that the, the human figures that you depicted in kind of pink and white, how they, how they understand you as the creators of, <laughs> of the agents and how they understand the agents, you know, as Eole, the kind of Greek gods of the wind. They become magical creatures. Inevitably, they'll become magical. They'll become mythologized. So I, that, I, I immediately started thinking about, I mean, taking it very seriously, like you've created a god of the weather, the, ag the agents are mysteriously labeled the agents, so, which echo chemical warfare <laughs> and germ warfare. But, but that's what they are, right? Chinese geoengineering uh, cloud experiments involve shooting up kind of agent chemicals. Um, so it's, it's huge. I don't know, yeah, but, um, and I, I, it's remarkably well executed, I, I'd say, but there's something very unsettling as well about, about watching it. Right, so this, it, and maybe that's on purpose, right? In which case, bravo. But I, I, I wouldn't forget that side of the, of the story. Um, I mean, there's this promise of, of, of AI, right? And you've kind of, the AI is God, and you've tapped into that somehow, right? Um, uh, yeah. Thank you. I can quote. Kate Bush, perhaps, because she's back in fashion. Um, I still dream of Oregon on. Uh, you're making rain, and you're just in reach. So that whole cloud-busting project around that song was all about Wilhelm Reich and those mad experiments with Oregon energy. But it seemed to be his undoing, at least as Kate frames it, that the government got really interested in this quickly. Um, because not only 
the seeding a cloud, bring rain and um, sort of agricultural benefit to one region, but it necessarily pulls it from another. So my question is, to the extent that in any region, if moisture at a given day and time is finite, and if your spray of beautifully designed droplet machines capture it, are they borrowing, they are borrowing, if not stealing moisture from one spot to another? Or is there something else in the layers that amplifies or makes up for a material difference? Because it seems to me this could get, you know, as you're saying, not just godlike really quickly, but, but adversarial very quickly. I'm just wondering, behind the project, are there considerations around this? you want to say about this? Oh, sorry. Because uh, the initial idea is like we're trying to stick on the passive design, so we don't want to involve too much uh, mechanical intellect uh, intellectual involvement as a machines. Uh, and we're trying to study three different phases of the water uh, as uh, like from the unit perspective and the liquid and solid and uh, gases. So yeah, we're trying to just understand the natural behavior rather than try to control them in different like aspects. We looked at um, <coughs> extreme uh, weather strategies around the globe. Um, we found even like we found even that I think Saudi Arabia tried to bring water by transferring an iceberg from Antarctica. Um, so <laughs> yeah, this this is a huge scale, I guess, right? Um, we. I, I, we, we saw our project more uh, related to a cloud seeding practice that is widely used in um, areas like China. Um, so we didn't see our agents as carriers because we want them to be so light and as part of the atmosphere, just a, as little as aerosols. Um, so we kind of, um, uh, we try to just augment but literally augment the weather system by augmented the amount of aerosols that exist in the atmosphere, um, which are actually the, the which is actually what facilitates the creation of clouds. Um, so our system is basically the transport agents that move around some um, and that, that give birth, let's say, to these aerosols um, in the places that we want them to to create uh, clouds, if that, you know. This would be perfect for terraforming Mars, hmm. yeah. rather than for saving Earth, maybe. Right? If you see, like, once you've nuked the poles and you've created a kind <laughs> of, like, process, right, then you need to, you need to just geoengineer the hell out of it. You know, it's just as it's already to China. Can I, perfect for that. Can I ask about your Collaboration. I'm yep. interested in you work as a team. Yep. I'm not quite familiar with the format of ADL. Are they, are they always work as a group? Uh, yeah. It's a group. Work. It's yeah. based on a team work. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, your production is amazing and it's stunning. Sort of, it's a, the, almost sort of a imagining you like a sort of a film crew or the, the movie <laughs> production the team that you know. How you divide your 
roles and tasks? Uh, I'm mainly working on designing the agent part. And I mean, we divided based on the skill set that we have. Uh, at, at the beginning, we had like research to be done, so we had so much research to be done collectively. We had so much discussion with the Theo. Uh, he was part of our discussion of how we can take the thesis and, and take it further. And then this is because this was a big topic. We had to collaborate intensively, you know, all the time. Discuss how, where do we take this project? Are we taking it into like, um, you know, you know, the the whole cinematic thing? The reason why we did cinematic is because it's not easy to communicate the idea, and we wanted to to make it as easy as possible. What what it is actually? What we're trying to do is like. We're trying to say we, or push the idea of why don't we think about it in an extreme, not extreme, but in, in a different way, you know, a decentralized mobile infrastructure. Why not? This would actually, you know, spark a dialogue, you know, and something. That's, I mean, do you, do you, I mean, it's really interesting. I, I mean, I, I'm kind of. I like this idea of the expanded role of the architect, you know, looking at the, the, the kind of global scene. But I'm just interested to know how you see yourselves. Are you are you kind of troubleshooters? Because because you you talked, one of you said, can we engineer the microclimate? And I, you know, in a way, what you're talking about is is kind of engineering the, the, the sort of macroclimate, you know, this is a kind of, this is a transnational kind of scenario. And I, it's just interesting to know how you place yourselves. Do you, do you see yourselves as part of a kind of group that is evolving a legislation that transcends national boundaries to deal with the climate control and, and augmentation like this? Yeah, uh, for us it was, we, we didn't, it was a very interesting exercise to start with. Um, we saw that more, um, we were also the online generation, we have, we have to mention, so that's why we emphasized a lot the cinematic aspect of the project. Um, we have, all our presentations were digitally basically. Um, and we, uh, we worked our main, um, tools were simulation tools um, and we worked also with machine learning and uh, so I think we see ourselves not that much related to the legislative aspect rather than to the like, um, problem solving of uh, like how computational and designing and, and engineering could address um, some like real issues and big issues and also we're interested in the relation between engineering and architecture and living and we tried like I think that this project might look very inhuman but very human as well in, in, in our minds uh, which was what that was the most interesting for yeah. us as well. We're, we're trying to balance out you know not to take it into the the, the pessimistic side of or control power. Like a it's paganistic more, yeah. aspect of technology. Yeah. Uh, how could we imagine a paganistic, uh, yeah, not paganistic, sorry, like a primitive, uh, something between primitive and uh, high tech. Yeah. So this is quite pro promotional in some way. You can sell the idea to the, I don't know, tech giants or other, I don't know, more kind of or whether maybe money is to actually realize it. I mean, do you, are you interested in pursuing that or just like the kind of... For sure. <laughs> it needs <laughs> <it is> guts. <laughs> but, but, I mean, I, I'm going to slowly start wrapping up. There's a lot of really big topics embedded in here. And it's a tremendously difficult. And, you know, as some of you will know, I, I spent a number of years trying to work out really how to do productive design research and where you begin to divide your energy between what we call capital R sort of research from a, an academic perspective and really open up the door to intuitive and kind of creative input, speculative thinking. 
I think the problem always comes when you're solving a problem. And because that can become extremely reductive mm -hmm. and one can have a very complete solution to what is a potentially extremely complex problem, which is where you get the God problem. <laughs> Um, so I'm kind of curious, and this is maybe an open-ended question, maybe a question for the day, is that, you know, to what extent does something like this, how serious are we? To what extent are we envisaging a plausible future and testing the capacity of certain, um, I suppose, technologies, areas of exploration, media, and to what extent does this really need to go into co collaboration with climate scientists, chemists, um, you know, material scientists, meteorolo me meteorologists, and to develop this for real. And if, if that's the inclination, then actually the presentation probably would be very different. But in some ways, this is almost a counterfactual exploration that is tied into an idea of a speculative future, which is why it could also exist on Mars, where it is, it, perhaps maybe if I were to add a chapter to your film, it would touch upon this mythical status, going actually also back to the seaweed project, you know, the epic of Gilgamesh, which comes out of the sort of the marriage of the sort of the mud and the water, or the earth and the water. So, you know, I think that there's, there's ways in which as a graduate program, you say, okay, what's, What's the purpose of our research? And what is the purpose of the dissemination of that research? Who is it for? And where does it go? You know, if, if you're seeding an idea, who picks it up? Because every idea is, has a potential to be dangerous. I remember working with a guy who was um, trying to determine um, the relationship between social capital and what he called subjective well-being, i.e. happiness. And this, and someone warned him in a seminar, he said, you know, this could really be taken up by some political party and exploited. And what do you know, a few years ago, um, the, gov the current government uh, decided to, you know, measure degrees of happiness in relation to things like credits and uh, degrees of welfare, and actually discovered that if you could just be married and join a church group, actually, you could be happy without money. This case, mm, yeah, yes, this is new. So I think, you know, every, every area of research has potential power um, and I think this is a question particularly as investing so much time and effort and wonderful collaboration, now you've gone into practice. What's next? Um, you've envisaged this incredible world. You've created a potential system that you could go on to develop. Would you do it? Is this, is this a, a kind of a complete and a picture that has finished? Or is it the a beginning of something? That's an open question. <laughs> I have a little more to say because I got really excited about the the, the, the small lecture from you because I think this 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 topic is very very popular and I I think this material reality like adaptive architecture as an element base is very important and and like uh, time by time if we think architecture as a like a, um, um, simulation results. So we have basic components like bricks. So bricks form walls, walls form space, space form architecture. But then, like in, in nowadays, uh, we use constant material, so the environment destroyed a lot. So this kind of natural understand, un understanding the nature will constantly like provide the space for human needs, for human activities. But at the same time, so we, we won't really consume a lot of energy, resource, and can make it l like constantly provide the space as needs and can be adaptive. I think this is also quite important in our DRL's research, research group from, from sales research, because uh, he, he used to try to understand, try to control a bit from machines part, which is, uh, but time by time, I think from our generation, uh, he's more into to understand the nature behavior rather than manipulating them. So th I'm just kind quite excited about this, so thank you. Um, I, you kind of blew my mind actually. I, was, I wasn't quite sure what to expect from the presentation. I think it's an amazing piece of work for all of the things that have already been said and I won't repeat, but you know, at first I thought this is amazing. Have they solved the global climate crisis? <laughs> and then actually, because it was, because I actually didn't, I understood it because of the way you chose to present it very clearly and digitally. 
I became quite afraid of it because I didn't understand it. And then I wondered what actually someone might do with the kind of positivity embedded in it. But that isn't the question. What I'm interested in is what your current employers made of your work and actually why you didn't go into engineering or science or find a research post for yourself where you could actually take the work that you've generated and understand. I'm sure you're not using in Foster's or Zaha. Maybe you're using your amazing digital skills, but is this, it's, you know, what, what is next in your career? What do you do with a project like this? I mean, we have this, <laughs> we, we were, we're constantly having this discussion. Like, we want to take it further, we want to at least share, the spark a dialogue or like, but for now we're, <laughs> we're trying to think, how can we take this further? Yeah. It's a good question. Yeah. I keep wondering it's, as well. Architectural education is like that, isn't it? You yeah. do your one, two, three, you, you're sent on a very particular journey because that's the way it's structured. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm always very excited to see architects doing this sort of work and then going somewhere else, taking your career in a different direction. And I think that's what the AA has given you. And, and maybe, not to be critical, but maybe you're not using that pathway that's been offered. I'm not telling you to leave your jobs. <laughs> <laughs> but you also have an opportunity to be a voice within those practices who are working on a scale of new cities in Saudi Arabia, and there's that huge mega project that I'm sure I think Zaha's involved in. And you know, we work with building services engineers on a phenomenal scale now. And there were a couple of things that you said. I mean, everyone has said. What I was, what I think we're all thinking, you know, it's slightly scary, but then it's done more than spark a conversation. And I think we're in a world now where we have to be really having that conversation and really making it reality, not something that looks augmented. That's the only part of your presentation that always leaves me feeling slightly, well, it's not, it's not real, but it is real. We are living through this just now. We've all come through a year this year where. We, it's the driest summer we've ever seen. We have rain like the other night. You think, when's it ever going to stop? And where is it going to go? But it's not enough because the ground is so hard and it can't, you know, we can't absorb that amount of moisture. So I think it's, it's phenomenal that you have a platform with this unit and you have this knowledge. And I think what Mary's saying is, how can we learn more from that knowledge? But maybe within how you represent your work, is try and make that message more real to me. You know, how can we educate politicians and scientists to actually make the human, you know, the public, human beings aware that something has got to, to shift. Um, but it's, it's really brilliant. Thank you. Is it simply just about asking who your next audience is? Who's the immediate audience if it's not garnering attention in the industry? Then maybe it's something you if you were to go back to the point about reframing it more as a kind of speculative what if short film as opposed to mm -hmm. a kind of deliverable engineering project, mm -hmm. uh, that might open up, sorry, if you're talking next steps, open up a, a different kind of way of getting into um, the wider world. Yeah, uh, sorry. No, no, please, please go. Okay. It's to remind me of a film uh, called Transcendence. I'm not so sure if you actually watched the movie, but uh, the, the, the idea inside it is, is another side. Like, they basically try to build nano, nano like machine to, to manipulate the whole world. But for us, for realistically, like in our planet, we covered like 74% of, of ocean. So that's lots of natural resource, like, I mean, not resource, but we, we should find a way to live balance between nature and humanity so we can have a better lifestyle. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, that's, that's a But I think this, this is a really important distinction, which I think is really critical to every architecture school. So, particularly at the AA, where you don't, you're not rubbing shoulders with chemists and meteorologists and anthropologists, etc. You know, you kind of have to go elsewhere to have that conversation. So there's a difference between fiction, science fiction and science. And 
you're treading a very delicate line. So I'm not to say that you know, science fiction has been a tremendous inspiration for scientists, and actually, to a large extent, it becomes somewhat prophetic. So it, it serves a very particular purpose, and I think we have to be careful of not trying to instrumentalize the work that we do. Not everything is pragmatic. Some things that are speculating about a future that may not exist, but plausibly could, or to call our attention to the world around us in perhaps an optimistic way, with a clear eye to the difficulty of the situation we're in. But then I suppose the question is, if we are to move outside of our own sphere, we say, OK, what if you wanted to get funding from the Gates Foundation, either for PhD work or to actually look at you know, Bill Gates as investing a tremendous amount in good ideas and for, for, to conquer or to address uh, the climate crisis? How would you build a, a strong body of evidence, of scientific evidence, behind the work that you do? And this is always a problem within architectures. We tend to be a little thin on the, it's good on the speculation, which we should not forget has value. But the question is that when we start to talk to those chemists, what would they say? How would, how would we explain it to them? Because they're a very different audience. So that it's not just about becoming a scientist, but being able to adapt to the kinds of conversations, the kinds of evidence that would need to secure the kind of funding um, stage two of this project, the editing of those ideas. And how actually, as a school, can we start to incorporate that kind of thinking so that we're not inventing things from first principles or, or simply serving all those people who then go out and deliver projects like this with our fantastic ideas? So it's a kind of big question for the next stages, no? I mean, statistically, not that many DRL graduates go on to do a PhD, but some do. Mm. And it, this is a project, that film, the proposal, mm would be a segue into a funded PhD line. And I only say this because the collaborative working, which Pierre has talked about in the last projects as well, you're already set up and familiar with it, but it would be a different kind of collaboration. It would be with the chemist and the meteorolog meteorologist. And it would be, I think, a place for... The, the, the work of DRL, I think, sometimes springs out of some passions that can then be realized in further study. I mean, a PhD, for all of your efforts to get into offices and do good work, and but I think there's also a point where you have to come back to this and ask yourself, do I need to also extend this? And there's a place for that, and it's a unique place, and I think it, it, would, it maybe would tap some of the collaborative um, dexterity you already have. Sorry. The, the, what most fascinated about this was quite special. The, you know, the cloud is very beautiful, and you know, different shapes and different you know, inside, and, so, I mean, this is part of me thinking, you know, this is, as you said, you, know, you wanted to study nature and understand nature, but that can be perhaps trans translated into more traditional mm. notion of space mm. as well. Mm. So, yeah, no, exactly. don't cross your architectural path. Oh, absolutely that, so. not, absolutely not. But sometimes I just think, you know, we, reality is, is rel relative, but some, you have to understand where you've positioned yourself in relation to it. I want to thank you so much. It's fantastic work. Thank Huge you. questions to ask. <laughs> we, we could continue all day. But um, thank you so much, and we'll move on. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just start. Um, hi, I'm Byung-ho Lim from South Korea. Um, I'm currently in second year uh, in uh, Intermediate 3 with Ricardo now. So today I'm going to just um, briefly explain uh, what I did for the last one year. So, um, OK, for the first one, uh, I also placed it on the table that um, it's about uh, redesign. So for the at the beginning of the first year, we had to think about like uh, how the, the symbolic idea can be the architecture and the reality. So. Um, I tried to, uh, I references the, the project name of New Babylon. Uh, the project is, uh, consists of six models, as you can see on the screen also. Uh, but it's just a, um, iconic um, ideas without any plan or sections. So for this time, I had to uh, figure out and guess uh, how can I make use of the, the idea in a real scale. So. 
Yep, this is the drawing. So um, I tried to uh, start with the plan and um, calculate the section and um, make the um, plan and section isometric based on the picture of the model. So. Uh, gradually, I, I uh, tried to make uh, one booklet about explaining how I transfer this idea into architecture plan and section. And this is the imaginary drawings of what is going to be happening in the large yellow sector. And this is section I made and linkage. So uh, at the end, last of the brief, I had to uh, apply the idea in the, the architect in the area in reality. So uh, at the case study, it is the how the the each sex sectors were gonna be linked in the horizontal way. But uh, for the, my f f uh, final work, I tried to uh, layer it in a vertical way. So yeah, my, my second project, uh, it was basically about redesigning the space of uh, research. So um, the, the place I decided to uh, redesign was uh, the DRA room. Um, so at first, I tried to make the 1 to 20, 12 models about uh, what it is uh, used now and try to uh, find out what kind of element I can apply. So, ah, oh, sorry. Yep, uh, this is my final pr uh, project of the uh, narrative pictures. Uh, those are one to twelve models. So for the uh, for this project, um, I experimented a lot about like how the light on the ceiling can direct the uses of the uh, moving way, and the the I changes the dimension and uh, different types of the brightness. So um, I try to think that uh, not only just a bright light, like which light and how bright, and uh, what it's going to be look like if I go out. So uh, as the narrative, I, I, I made uh, three scenarios from inside to outside. And uh, even if I didn't play any music or something, uh, as you can see in the screen, you can listen to, uh, you can guess the, how the music, the volume will going to be changed. and. Uh, the human figure we're going to be work. So for my uh, third project, um, I um, for this time, from this time, uh, it was all about my project. I had to find out uh, the which kind of architecture element I can use uh, on the on the night space. So um, based on the the uh, screens I showed. Um, I developed the model. I placed it on on the table. So, um, yep. Uh, my main focus was about the reflection of the light, uh, which means feels to me like expanding the space. So. Uh, as the model develop, I I tried to uh, uh, like uh, symbolize the how I develop and which kind of element architecture element I used in the following way. So, yep, this is the the final panel I made. So as you can see in the diagram on the right, um, it does not appear with the cross at, at the daytime, but uh, when it comes to the, the nighttime, the, the cross uh, suddenly appear, uh, re reflected by the, the window on the, on the uh, front. So, yep. And for the, my final one, um, um, for this time, I had to really think about what is the meaning of the color. Like, uh, even in the same color, like what the neon color, neon red, we're gonna be work, and uh, uh, what uh, what each color affect the, the mood of the people. So, um, I developed it uh, following three models. So this is my uh, first and second models. 
and um, not only the the models and the color, but what if I can't control the 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 color of the roof so that um, so that I can control the space itself. Uh, but um, for the last time, like I, I wanted to change not only for the color of the roof, but what if the the um, roof open and closed uh, following my my control, so that the outside can be inside and inside can be outside, and uh, what what I can think the the roof is. Uh, there are roof, but the other other walls are open. Is it interior design or exterior design? Like I I tried to think about it, and uh, I made it one to twelve models about how it automatically move. And um, even at night, what the scene is gonna be changed. So yep, this is the. The, the daytime view, and the, I use the neon color so that uh, the color change at night. And uh, the first and second uh, one is the uh, existing model, existing the house name of inverted house. But uh, for the third one, the last one is the model I made it. So how I can change it? Uh, I not only uh, use the visual effect, but effect, but also the the. What if I change the the roof? The the window gonna be changed, and how can I accumulate the the snow and the, how the light will gonna be, and how how can people can use? So this is the the uh, plan I placed it, and maybe for the last one I can show you the video. I added some music, but it's just not. <laughs> yep. So slow. <laughs> so, yeah, this is all for me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Over to this side of the table. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what what was this music? <laughs> I was very surprised. At that. Uh, basically, um, I, I don't know the n name of the music because, like, I was making the model at the uh, at the studio and someone played it, and wow, it's so nice. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe this represents like uh, what I li really like about all your work is. Maybe the serendipity and then the all the things that you just learned by doing things and working through so many models. It's really lovely. And yeah, I just love the range of experiences. And I guess that maybe what you're going to do now is work more on like the context or what action not only the, the shape of the space or the light, but what ha how people maybe live in this architecture in in the broader context. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so much lovely work. It was very joyful. Thank you. Is this a good brief given by the tutors? These are four sets of projects. Um, basically, for the uh, first and second one, uh, it is uh, given. But uh, basically, I can choose uh, which which area I want to de redesign and uh, which case study I want to do. So obviously, light and color was your choice. No, no, the first and second one. The the light one is the one I choose. Okay. Uh, uh, basically, for the first year, uh, I can I can apply which tutor I want to study with, and um, since I studied with the John in the second second project, and I really like the the way he he think about the color, so I just wanted to develop the the logic of the color and the meaning of the color inside. Did, have you? I mean, I really think it's an it's an amazing body of work, really um, 
Very impressive, and I, I, I mean, I, I just like the way you presented it. But, but what is your background? Did, did you come straight from school? Have you done foundation here, or um, basically? Um, I, I was uh, I was student in the University of Seoul when I was in Korea, uh, and I just uh, transferred to here so that I didn't uh, not need to do foundation. Um, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, yeah. It's, uh, Were you doing I mean, architecture no, in Seoul? Um, my first, I, I actually changed some some major a lot, and I was also in the army for three years. So, uh, not army, air force. So. So that's where it all comes from. Yes. Yeah. I agree. It's like it's just so much uh, creativity, and, and 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 also there's a sense of sh uh, um, confidence, which mm -hmm. I really love. Um, the moments that are most evocative are the ones where you just embrace the accidents, and I would lose the word control. Like you use the word control a lot, and actually, the, and the drawings that, that emphasize like the vulnerabilities of the space or the half-finished bits of the space, like this one or this one, are the ones to me that are the strongest. And I and I wonder what if you brought the drawing, the beautiful drawings you did of Constant in New Babylon, the sort of style of drawing into these projects. What would that look like? Um. Yeah, basically, um, I didn't uh, present uh, for my last project, which is the turn three with the teamwork. Um, so what if you did, what if you rendered these in, in that sort of language? What would that I mean? Is that something you thought about doing? Why you did these amazing kind of uh, flattenings of and, and mm -hmm. renditions, and then this, um, much more diagrammatic, which I understand. I understand you're kind of learning, mm -hmm. trying to communicate very specific points. You're not trying to confuse, you're trying to be precise. I, I get that. But yeah, could you, you imagine them together? Can you imagine kind of bringing all three bits here together somehow? Uh, yes, I, I, I did. <laughs> yeah, and um, I just showed uh, some, some, part, some part of the each project. Uh, but for the first time, I also did the digital drawing with the cat and um, and uh, for the, my second term, second one, uh, I also did some hand drawing um, and some sketch. But uh, the reason I showed it, uh, this specific uh, material is because, like, uh, as I do such material things, I got to know that uh, which project for which project is good for showing model and which project is good for the hand drawing. So for my last. Last one, like I can also do the rendering for the uh, nail moving, but uh, I really thought that uh, the project have to, like I really need to show how it can be moved and the uh, the controlled by the realistic world. So yeah. Just to echo what everyone's saying, it's a really lovely portfolio, and I think for year one, you've covered all of the ground. You've got every single skill set that you possibly need. Um, I wonder if I wonder, you know, you know, I guess to some extent at year one, what you learn is quite prescriptive. You know, you need to you need to understand how your hands work, how your you know where your creativity comes from. What, what's your version? So, so if I was to ask you now, what, what's, really, what's your favorite project out of this? What, what did you learn most from? What are the skills that you've learned that you think you'll really want to push mm -hmm. now that you've kind of tested yourself? Oh, you mean at the moment? Those? Yeah, right now, what are you? Um, at the moment, um, I, as I al already told you that I applied uh, the intermediate three, which is a lot about the hand drawing. Um, like hand drawing uh, with the abstract one. Um, like as I develop my project for the for the one year, um, I kind of uh, wanted to. I, I kind of felt that I need to uh, the the increase my capacity to hand drawing because um, like. When I have a look at the uh, attend the, the lecture by Peter Cook, he said that um, model is good and the idea is good, everything is good, but um, you really have to um, think about like the process uh, about thinking uh, through drawing 
and um, I really highly agree with what he said because um, like for the model if I made it it's kind of hard to change um, what I think but for the drawing um, I can control like erase it and yeah. develop so I yeah. think it, it really interests me because I think our industry, you know, as a practitioner, is just full of iteration and options and, mm -hmm. you know, that's what we do and we sort of look and use our skills to test things and there's not so much instinct or intuition, I don't think, deployed anymore in practice. Mm -hmm. And that's really what I'm wondering, whether that's something you're kind of realising or testing right now. Um, is that a bad thing to say, practitioners? No, 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 it's good. kind of it's. it's, it's that's what I took away from. It's really interesting this morning because we've come in with materiality and surface, and then water and climate, and then we're looking at light, and it's such so you know it's fundamental to to life and architecture and how we experience space. And so I, I was really fascinated by all these studies are from mm -hmm. precedent to taking them here and thinking about day and night and then how you, through your intuition, were making these physical models to manipulate and adapt. And it was that intuition that you passionately, to me, talked about and, and it was really interesting and great to see it in first year and to sort of pick up and understand that by the doing and understanding the doing, you're taking that forward in your next move within the school. So it seems that you are learning through making, which is which is a really good skill to have at an early stage because then you know you will move through and be into a different physical space of a computer or you know wherever that takes you to. So understanding that you want to learn more through doing this, I think is a very nice thing to see. I think there's something quite profound in um, how the model plays a role in this. Um, and one thing I might suggest is when looking back on it is ask yourself how you're operating in relation to Constant. So you're going to be an architect, Constant with no pretensions about being an architect, whatever intended to be. And I think it comes down to this idea of the stand and of course the graphic. So this autographic work, mm -hmm. the hand of the artist makes the work directly, makes the portrait. Mm -hmm. The graphic work, such as writing score music, where the work is outside of the making of the hand. And that's what architects find themselves most of the time, unless you build it. So, Constance's work, you we picked up on the six models, which are beautiful constructs, but arguably Constance's art existed outside of all of the things he made. It kind of existed through his dialogue, mm -hmm. through television interviews, through the presentations. The, the works were amazing in themselves, but they weren't the whole project. The project was this kind of wonderful narrative. Um, your work has a kind of similar role in the sense that in making these models, and to me, these models almost are the architecture. Um, I know it's not everything, it's really living through that model. And it's trying to work out where the model stops and where the architecture begins. It's, it's trick as you go for mm -hmm. you know, There's some really profound things about representation, where you sit in that world, and how you relate to art as an architect. You know, it's fascinating, it's great, it's really, really well crafted. Mm, thank you. I mean, I'm glad you went to the Peter Cook lecture, <laughs> but I think you could have your join and eat your model too. I think you're doing good work in both directions. There's something about the flexibility of the model as you use it, or at least how you represent it um, in the 70s, the Institute for Architecture and Urban Studies made this exhibition and this catalog. But they talked about there's nothing as jealous as a photograph of an architectural model. But there's something about model photography which seizes upon a sort of sleight of hand that's so convincing in certain respects that you can sort of jump into a reality very quickly. And what I see you doing is playing that out in really interesting ways, and then somewhat on the video as well. But I think you're very careful about how you crop things. Occasionally, you, you present the model as an object, but occasionally you crop so that we're in something that could be any scale. This is quite convincing on its own. Mm -hmm. That could be built. Okay. So there, I think there's something about the flexibility of the model you might want to 
give equal credence to as, as you've discovered the drumming. I agree wholeheartedly to return to the drumming and move away from the diagram might be a great current project, but I wouldn't let go of this, this way you interrogate this question of light it seems so robust because of the model, and I would hold on to that and actually continue that work in parallel with the drawing. Mm -hmm. It's really nice. Thanks, Liz. Thank you. I just wanted to ask about um, the, the titles. Well, the one title that you mentioned, which came out to me, was was the nocturnal marriage. Yep. Yeah. Is that your title? Yep, my title. I this is it. your title. Yeah, no, basically. I, mm -hmm. I thought that was very interesting mm -hmm. for me because it enriched the kind of presentation. It, it mm -hmm. sort of, I could, you know, for me, I could, I could see all, I could make all sorts of readings and the implied narratives of that title correlated to the images that you're showing. You know, I, I started thinking about the city, whereas, you know, the, the other projects were maybe about interiority. Mm -hmm. So I, I, mean, very, I just think this idea of how you might name things yeah. and continue with that mm -hmm. kind of, pro it's, a very, it's a really important kind of consideration as one's evolving one's work through mm -hmm. practice even, yeah? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, the project was basically about the darkness and the night, and um, like I, I, I was thinking, like, what what kind of visual effect can the happen only at night, and uh, what is the meaning of the meaning of the, the some object appearing only at night, and I thought uh, it have to be something special, and um, I used the 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 reflection um, based on the, the scene I'm walking around the London. So, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, actually, the name was, uh, naming was not that hard for me because it was just a night nocturnal and married. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so in terms of light, you focused on the the artificial light, but mm -hmm. have you also looked at natural light and darkness and shadow? Um, at the moment, or...? Well, well, it, well in, I guess in your sort of study, and then perhaps, I don't know, that's the yeah, that's that's quite, quite far to reach uh, area to really uh, uh, look into. And I don't know, the one thing that I'd suggest is uh, some sort of analytical drawing, maybe, you know, in time, you talk about reflections and, mm -hmm. and, and stuff like that, which could be also uh, observed more carefully in, so you know what surface is it reflecting onto, and, and, and what you know kind of a, how that light travels, and mm -hmm. I, I don't know, just a sort of a. Are you talking about like a people's m mood or the visual effect? Uh, it is your mood, I guess, mm -hmm. but uh, why the mood is created from mm -hmm. you know to do with the sort of materials and you know time and yeah. so so yeah, it's just a. I'm just suggesting, you know, this is, can develop into much more yeah, thank you. In, further interesting study. Yeah, I, I really might have to think about that deeply. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's, I'm going to probably move on, just a few sort of wrapping up statements. Let's not forget that we're always in the process of interpretation. I thought your comments might be really spot on. You know, you're, you're kind of always circling this idea that may or may not become reality, but then if you produce a building, so if all of this work is eventually built, it will become subject to inhabitation, to misuse, um, to misinterpretation. Mm -hmm. And I think there's something wonderful about being this, uh, this sort of imaginative and sometimes passive actor in space. And then that marries, I think, very smoothly with this idea of iteration. And I like also you're saying, Mark, that you know, models, you can think through models as well. Um, there's obviously the one, there's a wonderful study of the, the models that were developed for the, the Prada project for Isaac de Mont in Natural Histories, which is the book that is potentially disappearing from various collections. I don't want to have mine. I don't know if you have yours. But um, the way in which one can move radically between materials and form and to test and to test and to test again, um, to not lock down an idea and simply use the model as a representation but as a mode of quite free exploration. 
So I think, you know, please, I think the idea that you're, you're using hand drawing this year is fantastic. It's actually something that I think we're rediscovering in a really productive way at the moment in architecture schools. But what the, I suppose, what is a drawing or a model of value? They all have value, but they serve different purposes. So there isn't always a sense of completeness to the thing that they're making. And I just think, you know, it's, there's, a, there's this idea, again, of the musical score, which I think is a wonderful one. I remember also architecture was described to me as a little bit like writing a play, similar, similar analogy, where in that play, that, um, that musical score, can have multiple productions and can be multiply interpreted and to gain color and texture mm -hmm. along the way. So I think you know, it's a wonderful start. I think you've had a fantastic first year, and I hope, I hope to see you try it in So thank you so much for your work. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Hello, my name is Theresa um, and I joined the AA last year for third year with Max Antonelli and Emma for Experimental 12. Um, and now I'm continuing with the diploma with Shin uh, in DIP 11. And I'm going to talk about my project called Stadtflucht, which means city escape in English. And it's about a housing system for rural Germany. What triggered this project was the pandemic. Corona had a big impact on the lives of many people. It is the changed way we look at the quality of our own life, the dissolving separation of the domestic and the office, and it is often also financial aspects, which have led many city inhabitants to an intensified consideration of moving to the village. The project analyzes the potentials and struggles of the berlin Brandenburg relationship and the question, the way we live in cities today. It gives an ecological lightweight building solution for the countryside, which uses the resources, which characterizes the life in the rural and connects them with a new way of living, working, and communal coexistence. The future of the rural is a counter proposal to the suburbs of the metropole. This presentation is structured in four topics, the rural, the specific context where I will implement the system, the system itself, and the construction. The debate about constructing housing or architecture has been mainly focused on the city for many years. But new publications like Countryside by Rem Kohlhaas or freshly opened exhibition Architecture on the Countryside express an architectural interest for the village. This attention can be observed already in the 19th century Back then, the city was cr criticized for being the gigantic outcome of the industry, which is responsible for the alienation of man from nature. The Lebensreform movement longed for a simple and healthy, collectively lived natural life in the countryside. The big difference is that the countryside today has new working and transport possibilities because of digital communication tools and electromobility. Rural areas are defined by municipality until 20,000 inhabitants as a loose residential development, low settlement density, a high proportion of agricultural and forest land, as well as a low population in the outskirts of big city centers. According to these definitions, around 90% of Germany is rural. The same applies for whole Europe. Over 80% of the area is used for food and material supply. 47 million people, almost half of the population of Germany is living here, and at least 69% of German people value the high quality of life in rural areas. Germany is polycentral and rural. The clearly separated urban and rural landscape shape our central European settlement structure and are seen in times of climate change and social segregation as a model for the future. But it can only become a model for the future if we change the building culture in the countryside in the city. In cities, social segregation can be observed by looking at the rising rents and housing shortages. My generation can't afford buying a property in the city anymore, and the fear of getting pushed to the edges of the city can be observed. Since the countryside offers affordable land, people who move there take big properties and place single-family houses on it. These destroy former lively villages and the ecosystem. 
Looking at the traditional village formations, this has been different in the past. They almost collect, th these were almost like collective settlements or they originate themselves to the landscape. They can grow together and become more dense over time. Around Berlin, a movement with community oriented motives can be observed. They show how communal movements can bring quiet villages back to life, if only a ground for communication between the old and the new inhabitants exists. Many of the one-person households of the city long for more community. Different from the city where the housing prices don't allow experiments, in the countryside can be seen as an incubator for new ways of living, and these ideas can be implemented in the city afterwards. Brandenburg especially has a huge development potential. The rural area around Berlin hasn't benefited from the immense growth of the capital due to its former affiliation with the GDR. The federal state is remarkably poor compared to the surrounding areas of other major cities like Munich. A property in Mülrose, one hour and 50 minutes by train away from Berlin, is taken as a case study to implement the building system for communal living in rural Germany. The new neighbors. The former Pension am See has been out of, sore, out of use for 10 years. A group of Kreuzberg people, including young families, currently develops 30 tiny houses on it. Since the market and the states have failed to provide affordable housing, the alternative to private home ownership is housing cooperatives. By only owning a share of the corporation which owns the dwelling, the speculative value is limited and so not influenced by the fluctuations of the real estate market. By law, the property is restricted for short period stays. This land use law makes the property especially cheap. But instead of staying temporary, I imagine the group to stay permanently on the property. The group represents a holistic image of man. Living, working, sleeping and leisure time happens all in one place and all in community. Why going into the trap of all autonomy when the countryside offers unused resources for an alternative way of living? The Überlebensinstinct, survival instinct, leads to a Leben, a life on the countryside. The young group of adults and families of around 90 people decides to stay on the property in Müllrose. During the week, they work from home or in the rental co-office in the village square, which is a 12-minute bike ride distance. Close to here, they can go food shopping at Edeka, and additionally, they get delivered by a local fruit crate. The train station is a 10-minute bike ride. Instead of consumption-driven activities like in the big cities, the main leisure activities are swimming, hiking, and fires. The kids have a lot of space to move freely. Here you can see the parking lot, the communal areas, which include a shared kitchen, an open space for workouts or events, as well as private flats. Instead of having big own accommodations, the home is separated in smaller flats and communal areas which can be used when needed. Taking a spoonful of Kreuzberg people and mixing them under the inhabitants of Mürose can also create conflicts. Smaller groups have stricter rules and traditions, while the city creates an atmosphere of anonymity in which hidden desires can be lived out without anyone taking notice. This clash of culture needs room for communication. The pier and the village square should get activated for this. The site plan of the current developer group shows an architecture which prioritizes the individual and takes away big areas of the forest property. Instead, an alternative was analyzed. The aim was to combine the houses to create a smaller <coughs> footprint, but at the same time allow spaces for communication and interaction. The courtyard layout forms community in the inside of the system and private space facing to the forest on the outside. By laying out the plan on a big grid, the system can grow and connect with each other, which allows the buildings to adapt to changing uses in the future. The system. Since 1992, 5,000 new square kilometers floor have been sealed in Germany. This happens not in the cities, but especially in the countryside. And it has a huge impact on, the, on our planet. 
The rainwater of today, which is not getting into the groundwater, cannot become rain again and is causing the flood and drought of tomorrow. Despite the large plot of land, this system and this place uh, and the low land prices, the housing typology is based on the minimum required instead of the maximum affordable living space. Only the core touches the ground while the extending structure is lifted up with group high foundations. Like the Martin Wagner's growing house, the apartment houses can grow from a minimal core to the outside and leave no traces behind after deconstruction. Thus, the space requirements can be adapted to the changing financial resources or changing phases of life on the inhabitants. The minimal living space is available in three sizes, S, M, L, enabling a variety of living situations for singles, families, or shared living communities. The expandable floor plan is laid out on a 3.8 by 3.8 meter grid and allows flexibility of use around the core. Coming to the construction. Building on the countryside can mean bad accessibility to the property. That requires a construction method that does not exceed the dimensions of a trailer load. If necessary, the system should be able to be built up by poorly trained workers and without large machinery. Starting with building the earthquake core on site by the inhabitants as a method to create community. The timber frame construction around it will be built up by construction site workers. The standardized system keeps the prices at the minimum due to the screw foundations. No permanent damage will be left on the property even with the building as demolished. The off-the-shelf ETB90 timber frame connector allows to easily assemble and disassemble and then spark the wooden skeleton. Here in the model you can see how the connector works. Uh, you pull this in like this and if you, you hammer it in and then it like stays there and if you deconstruct it you simply hammer the beam out again. Sorry, this used to be bigger. <laughs> it's everything which is left of the model. <laughs> <clears throat> Almost without exception, the multifamily houses are built with ecologically harmless materials. The earth brick core brings thermal mass into the lightweight construction and thus reduces the heating requirements and ensures a good climate in the building. The building functions autonomously with low energy and low tech strategics. To sum up, one can say that the rule can be a real alternative to escape the stressful, expensive cities for those who are working digitally and are independent, longing for more natural surroundings and who are open-minded of living in a community. To reduce our ecological footprint, we need to moderate our needs. Sharing spaces, flexible spaces, sealing no soil, sourcing local building materials, using as little concrete as possible, and wearing wool sweaters indoor instead of using pore insulation at the outside. These are the principles according to which the system for the countryside is planned. Yeah. Um, extremely thorough. So that's fantastic. Um, and and uh, and it's exciting. It's exciting. It's interesting. And you can see all the different. It's almost prepared for the different angles that one might approach with. But just for the sake of conversation, I'm going to push two things. Um, this is a publication as you, as you move to the next stages of um, designing. Is one is you know your definition of the world. So very early on, you bracket 80 percent of the Europe or Germany as Rural or forest, which is not the same. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, sorry, the rural is a design landscape over you know, hundreds and hundreds of years of human kind of cultivation, right? and there's whole political economy to the rural. And then the site you chose is an hour out of Berlin, which to me is somewhere on the edge of suburban rural as well, right? So there's almost an urban bias in how you define rural. 
this, right? So maybe potentially, because then there's the other kind of potential. There's the rural, there's the natural, there's the suburban, or at least the kind of very edge of the suburban, and then there's the kind of book, the kind of fortress market, the city that never was, right? The kind of medieval town sort of thing. So town is also um, a piece, right? And they all have their own public home, right? And they all have their own line information, their own idea of what it means to live together, in a way. So, in a way, that's the vulnerability of the project, which is actually the kind of the project is on a right? But, but that's also the publication. <coughs> One can realize that we actually have a kind of um, urban bias even when we pro promote the world, right? Because, because then one imagines that, you know, you, you, you promise that um, all forms of consumption will be satisfied by living here, in a sense. That, you say, maybe people can like it, we can get food here, we can get as if it's some outpost in space. <laughs> but actually, there's a whole also mode of socialization that's possible. And that brings me to the picture of Grace Jones. Mm -hmm. So why do you put Grace Jones in your rural house? <laughs> so to me, it's, not, oh, it's clearly not an accident, and, and I wonder how intentional it is or it's not. But to me, it may be a payoff here, but you're, you're offering the kind of um, cosmopolitanism that affords things like fluid gender identities are possible in the world as well as in the earth. Right? So the idea of being a stranger, which was similar, tells us the city can offer, is also possible in the world. But maybe that's not why people see the world. Or maybe it is why people see the world, but in a different kind of strangerness. Hmm. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Is that, is, do you think that's actually why the great? Is that my totally in my head? Or? <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, like with a poster, I kind of had this idea in mind that the rule has these restrictions in terms of like traditional aspects which are just it's also beauty it's also quality of the rule but it's just more defined than if you go to bigger cities i have the feeling the people are kind of more linked because the exchange is so much there if i go to new york i kind of have like the same like people kind of around me like i have here or in berlin but if i go to the countryside it's like really uh, specific and I think there's like there can come like this kind of clash between the different cultures but I think there's also a quality in it and preserving it so bringing up the posters kind of like showing this identity of the city maybe in the rule. Like a, a nostalgia or like a memory <laughs> like people who live on, on tropical islands have photos of like the Alps or people who live in, <laughs> in the desert, this kind of thing. Mm. But, but I mean, I, 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 so mm -hmm. I'm just going to stop and say, what, 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 what makes me wonder is what is your imagination of sociality mm -hmm. in this place? Mm -hmm. It's very easy also to project, and I, I know you're aware of this, to project the kind of East German mm -hmm. kind of new city mm -hmm. vision here, and I know that you're probably aware of that, of course you're aware of that. So, how, so I'm just wondering what, what the idea of socialization, the small medium large, the idea of socialization, what, what community means here. Mm -hmm. You have, these, you have these photos of uh, kind of rural kind of hippies at some point as well. Yeah, it's actually no, it's actually like a it's a real project which is happening there. Right. But they are planning like a different, like they are planning to do these thirty tiny houses on it. And I'm, I mean, my project is not specifically about this property. It's more something you can scale to like different places in Germany as mm -hmm. a system. But I think it's kind of interesting what is happening there, that there are these 30 parties of different people, um, all coming from Berlin, deciding to like build up a group project on this property and how this should like look like. And there's a community just by an ape, like building up this project. There's a lot of conversation since like two and a half years. Um, so I think by actually, like we had kind of, we got a distance to like building our own houses or like being engaged with actually the building process. But it used to be a practice which formed community. And by actually creating this project, creating these houses, a community is like engaged again in the building process. That's a really good point. Though. Yeah. This, what image of rurality and to, are you aiming towards and does this facilitate? It seems to me like it's a kind of one based around the coin. It seems to be utopian edge to this, a la kind of William Morris at some level that there's a craft and a, and a community involved in building the community physically to make the community, which seems actually 
quite clear cut. It took, it took a while to get them in the presentation. I, I did think the presentation was really, um, really clear, super clear. Um, the only thing that threw me was the, the, the painting, because um, it brought, a, brought up an idea of the kind of mythos of the reality that my morality for me is very much rooted in um, the British understanding of it. So how it translates to Germany, I don't know. I'd be really fascinated to know. But what um, there's one book I keep thinking of in relation to your project, which is a kind of uh, it's by Raymond Williams, 1973, called The Country and the City, and it dispels um, myths around what makes rural Britain, and he basically argues that it's a construct. Um, that it's never really existed as a nostalgic kind of um, story told by certain elites to construct a various tiers of society. What I find very strong about your project is it, is it, it doesn't deal with nostalgia, for me at least. It seemed unapologetic in the way that it introduces a um, kind of modern approach to commune. And it doesn't involve itself in nostalgia in, in, in the sense of dealing with issues around um, the styles of architecture. Um, it's, it seems like a, a modern approach to an age-old issue, but there's also something around the fact that I don't really know, but I'd love to know what constitutes a German reality beyond data and stats. Um, what is the kind of story around that? Germany is, is a young country, or the history of a productive landscape, or is it the history of uh, peasantry? I, I don't know. Um, so that's why I'm, I see the project as being very much rooted in the now, in communes of the 20, 20th and 21st century. Um, which I find kind of brave, but at the same time it leaves me wanting to know a little bit more about the history of that kind of state of living. Mm. I really enjoyed your presentation and it was really thought. I really liked how, how you brought us in this story and made us believe that, I mean, which maybe we all believe that you could live in the countryside in this way. I mean, it's just. In, in France, there's a new there's a new law that says you can't build on like if you can't build not on artificial land anymore. So I met a lawyer and she was dealing with a client uh, from a small village, uh, a developer that was complaining that the only solution to build now in the village was to do like a, uh, apartments. Actually, I thought you brought us, and he was saying no one wants to live in a village in an apartment. <laughs> so this developer was very troubled. But then I thought actually that you could you brought us in this story and you probably would have convinced this developer and that <laughs> that maybe would be that's great. the role of an architect also to to show a different way of living. I I just had a question I mean your project and, and reminded me of, and when you talked about holiday life, like these are holiday homes you live in, then you would live in permanently. It reminded me of like in the UK of like the, the plotlands. Uh, a bit further north of London, and that made me think of the aesthetics of your project is very minimal, and I, I just wondered, maybe it's linked also to like the who lives there, the Grace Jones, that just wondered where maybe it's more like the kind of DIY aspect or the, the materiality of the project. For me, it doesn't look like a co-op or a commune that I know in the UK. But this is Germany, so maybe the aesthetic <laughs> sense of co-ops in Germany is very different. But or maybe that's something you want to explore with Shin this year. Mm. <laughs> the maternity messiness. Messiness. Yeah. When, I don't know. When Grace Jones was mentioned, I also heard Wes Jones. Right. I think there's a kind of mm. potential for this. Interesting. Mm. Yeah. Perhaps I don't know. I missed in your presentation who is actually living there, but I don't know. It's, what, what, who are they? Are they s professional singles or? Yeah, these, uh, it's like 30 parties, but like including the children and everything, it's like 90 people. And uh, they live in Berlin currently, and they are working in like different fields, like uh, many people like independent or like digitally. Um, so they kind of can continue with their work from there and like just commute to the city from time to time, like over the weekend maybe, but like the main base right. would so be there. Are, there are some families as well. Yeah. yeah. Just, uh, you presented a typology which is quite actually um, specific. You know, this bed is contained within the core 
uh, with no window um, and serialized in such a way that almost, yeah, sort of a yeah, kind of single bed um, um, rooms. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. It just uh, kind of questions me. That, that I'm working on this project for sampled housing in, in New Cross, which is sort of, uh, you know, this housing corp that I established in the 1970s. It's actually the British first housing corp. Mm -hmm. And uh, their rules are you know, just they only have a single bedrooms. There's no families allowed. And some people are living there for, for a long time. But it's a quite traditional community as well. The people come in and move out. But uh, that's the way that somehow governs their own uh, sort of community. They uh, keep the rent cheap. And then, you know, on the ground, they have a, um, you know, a, a lot of gardens and pizza ovens and, you know, this kind of a community space. It's because the rooms are very tiny. Mm. And then they have a communal kitchen. They share a kitchen to cook dinner together. So I, I don't know, I couldn't see that in your drawing. Mm. Yeah, there are these like three different uh, sizes of the core. Um, like a single core, then like a three people core, and then a, like five to six people core. And then there's this like flexible system around, which could also allow like new bedrooms or new possibilities to adapt to the space. And they actually, like the windows are actually facing to the forest. Uh, of the core, this is, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I mean, I also really love, love your project. I think it's, it's very elegant and, and beautifully kind of detailed. You know, the process of showing how the construction comes together is really kind of exciting to me. Um, I, I, the, the, the comments I wanted to make apart from that is, is just, um, about who it's for. I mean, I know this conversation has come out, but, but you know, because I have a little bit of involvement in Berlin where they have the Baugruppe sort of initiative, which is about the city, but I, I gather that that is sort of slightly going down because land availability is not there and cost of land is going up. So this idea that, you know, people who have that interest, and they, they tend to be slightly alternative, if you like, um, in the way that there's, you know, that kind of condition doesn't exist in, in, in the UK or in London. But I, I think it's, it really interests me that there may be potential for this kind of development to take place outside the immediate locale of the city. And the, so, I mean, you know, I think it has legs, maybe, but I, you know, would need to kind of know more about that. But, mm -hmm. but I, I like the way this is kind of, you know, you've got this document trailer park system. So the immediate setup is the trailer park, <laughs> and our experience of trailer parks in in, in, in the UK, you know, they they they're sort of they they are not great comp complement to the landscape, to the rural landscape, yeah, and to the agricultural rural landscape. You know, and, and in a way I think again, I think I would support a kind of initiative like this, but then I would like to talk I'd like more information about how it operates on a communal level. And just you talked about access by bicycle, but you know people would drive here, they would be have to there would have to be some kind of parking system. Mm -hmm. And I would like to know more about those kind of initiatives and how it engages with the kind of agricultural landscape, you know, and whether you shift from large scale agriculture to a kind of notion of cultivation and horticulture. I think these kind of things but it's a it's a really delightful setup. So you know, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> I think it's like a professional. I was just so impressed by your presentation. You know, if, if you were to place the work right now, if you came into my office and this was in your portfolio, I'd probably say, "Oh, this is about Reaper Stage Green Plus." I'm going to tend to, you know, it's that that amount of detail and explanation has just been embedded in the work, and it you described it very naturally. And I think I don't know if. It's such a lovely document. I mean, even the paper is so well shaped. You can flip through it. 
the reason. Um, so, congratulations. I mean, it's, it's just very, very good and very, very clear. Um, I judged a competition, a co-living competition in Greece, mm. and it was sort of UK-based, and it was sort of to win quite a substantial prize, but it was a really interesting debate, because I think in the, at the end of this debate, nobody was really convinced that anyone would want to do it, you know, because I think the much deeper question is, who, who does? Who are the 30 people? Do they really want to live together? And for how long? And what type of people would actually want to commission it in the first place? How long does it last? And we want. We were looking in all of the submissions it, to, to see if anyone was sort of asking that question: What, what would a, an architecture look like? And how how far back would you need to go? Would it need to be a building that educates? children to sort of have to teach us to live a different way. Mm. And the other, you know, we, we questioned whether it was some form of escapism, is it something, is it co-living something that's come out of, you know, us being depressed about the world that we live in? Or is it um, a kind of second home mindset? You know, and I think, you know, I made a really mean comment about Lots of the images showed beautiful people spinning ceramic pots and wearing beautiful Margaret Howell clothes. You know, I just, <laughs> so we didn't kind of come to any conclusions about what it, what, where the need was. Mm -hmm. But like I said, I can imagine a client wanting this, having commissioned you, you presenting it, winning the job, and then you know, off you go. So, yeah, I think there's practice comments there and we'll have more mm -hmm. deep set academic questions through this. AA has a rural campus. So the smart house at Berlin it begs a kind of book park question or two. Or to commission the system of book park would be a nice idea. The problem with book park is the master plan looks one way, but on the ground, you know, it, there's something else going on. It has to do with services. Like each of these uh, has a plan where 25% of the given floor plate is given over to kitchens or, or places to, to dine. Likewise, the larger landscape, and there's a little communal cooking maybe there, but all, these guys are foodies. And there's something about all the things that require is the electricity, the heating, the water, all the services, and where they're coming to meet these prisms in the landscape would be a question. It gets complicated. A hook, I'm sure, we get complicated here. So there's that question, along with the parking and other sorts of infrastructural questions. But if we go to the idea of consumption and, and cooking as a maybe a mythology of this piece, um, are if these are foodies, is there a connection to allotments or foraging, or is there a collective farm? If, if so much of this is about the, the glory of preparing food and consuming food as a community or separately, does that, does the emphasis of plan play out as a kind of larger site planning consideration for you? Mm. Is the agricultural part of the rural, right, as opposed to the forest? Could you repeat the question? <laughs> this, this emphasis <laughs> around mm -hmm. food preparation and dining that mm -hmm. plays out in plan, does that also play out in how you envision the project? Does it link up with modes of producing or mm -hmm. cultivating or I don't really see the people suddenly starting to do their own agriculture. There are like the there's an edeka in the village. There's like these like local food crates which get delivered to the place. So it's not really necessary. I think that would like romanticize the project. So it stitches into the larger uh, agricultural community. It, it needn't be itself one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> This is, this is a big question. Mm -hmm. At some point, because you're bringing this kind of context of, of foodiness, which at some point, <laughs> move on to the point. Yeah. Well. But, um, I mean, I, I, it's, it's a beautifully presented view as work. And um, I mean, myself, I had a master's student at Kingston for two years, which I just focused on looking at settlement. And it was pre pandemic, but it was a rural community thinking about how we could. Uh, how we could build housing within in the, the 
kind of highlands of Scotland. And the, you know, the fact that the locals that need affordable housing don't get it, and all the affordable housing that was there are the second homes for people from Glasgow and Edinburgh who want to have this long view. So there's just so much in your project that is reality. I think what would be interesting, maybe that's something that you would go on with someone like Shin's unit, um, is the kind of architecture, the identity of place making, which is extremely important within the rural, because it's what can get lost and does become something that um, is not, um, it becomes an eyesore and it's very difficult, you know, there's many rules within why it's difficult to build within that, to do with planning, um, to do with anonymity of architecture, because we looked at a settlement where you just were not allowed to build. Um, and these sort of, you know, this sort of protection of, of, of land. Um, and how can the architecture work within that? So even though I was, applaud you for having this system of construction and working to sort of flatbed building, to bring materials to a site that can easily be constructed and don't take this sort of um, expertise per se, but it can look beautiful and it can be having its own identity and is this a framework that then those that settle there can then adapt and think about how they can transform and just having simple story forms isn't necessarily very rural you know the idea of kind of being a marker within a landscape is something that's quite interesting so I think there's a lot of um, you've done the you've chopped the vegetables it feels to me with what you're showing and now it's time to sort of cook a little bit more and I think it would be really interesting in your diploma to think about how you could, you could develop that but I mean it's such a, a great subject and, and you know, you've done it that well yeah, that kind of character also can come from the community itself, you know, mm -hmm. who, who they are and what exactly. their identity is. Yeah. Especially you have a real community there that, I don't know, have you actually took this project to them and showed to them, see what yeah, they think? Yeah, I'm, I'm involved in this project. I wasn't, I wasn't actually, like when I started it, like when I started this year, but now mm -hmm. I'm more engaged in the project. I just wanted this to and um, something about trailer park because I mean I'm, yeah. I'm seeing this in the context because it's on your document. The trailer park is, is a kind of fairly dystopian feature of mm. the English landscape. So I don't know about Germany, mm. but but there's something about planning legislation because mm. the, the trailer is a temporary home. It's a mobile element that can be taken away, and I suppose you're putting screw piles into your into the ground. I mean, I just wondered about mm. that moment of whether, the, you know, you have to think about that as different maybe in Germany, um, that, that, um, mm. that these buildings, are, how are they viewed? Are they viewed as permanent or temporary? This kind of, that, that can change one's mindset. I think there's a lot of things. I'm going to do a little wrapping up because yeah. we're going to hook to Hook Park for lunch, <laughs> and, um, which is a good, a good tie-in. I think this goes back to a little bit of what we were talking about with also a DRL, which may surprise you, in that you've pitched this as covering everything. It's a social system. It's a commentary on the urban and the rural. And it's also a piece of architecture that you're showing as plausibly changing and adaptable and also inhabited. One is a social issue, one is a, system, a systems issue. And it's kind of curious. It means that one is going to fall down to some extent. I think that what we're trying to, it probably isn't part of your conversation, this is a little like R50 in the, in the woods. Um, R50 was inhabited by largely middle class creators, many of them here. And um, um, there's also a culture of the house by the lake, yeah. which is throughout Germany, which is also very middle class, if not now a middle class um, luxury. So we're talking about a very, very specific social context. Mm -hmm. We're talking, potentially, if you're looking at a co-op of a community that moves and changes. Um, there is the messiness of children. There is the problem of child rearing. There's the problem of who's stuck at home on a perk farm, who else goes off to the train station to go into the center of Berlin, who's really working remotely. So those social issues, you're 
but really, I think you can say, not currently a problem, because you've developed something that is actually quite constrained. I would argue that there's a kind of top of, you've created something that's an abstraction of a courtyard, we can get a why. So there's certain very, very strict rules that you've made that actually sit apart from the social context. I think what you don't mention is all that kind of early Soviet work and the arguments around Islamism, which were then eventually rejected as too restrictive. But they had very specific ways of controlling a new form of social cohesion. Um, and they're not dissimilar. I mean, this is like, like a, a looser version of Narkin, but you know, it's like more chicken spoken than those. I think it's worth considering that, and then also, you know, the, the disurbanism that also had degrees of articulation, but had f kind of forms and uh, very specific constraints that were then manipulated to form a series of types that then could accommodate a thousand people that sat in these linear the cities and that sat outside of Moscow. So I think there, there's like a nod to this, that it's like you're restructuring society, but it's not full of kids. And then maybe, maybe the interior shot you don't need, or maybe you have to hold back from that. I'm kind of curious what you do this here, and where do you, where do you pitch your argument? Mm -hmm. You can't do everything. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious to see what happens in the coming year. But should, before, I'm, I'm gonna be too strict because we're way over and no one can get lunch. <laughs> But uh, can we hook to the park and um, join the people in the woods? Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>
and so this is where the field station actually comes in. Um, and as a general description, we wrote um, field stations for life protected environments in which researchers and that long-term situational studies required for making fundamental discoveries. At Hook, discoveries occur at the convergence of making and engaging, observing and recording, workshop and forth. This diversity of positions is neither static or permanent, it is responding and continuing. A uh, field station is an extension of this convergence. It aims to address the desire to conduct contextual research within the forest condition and extend making beyond the confines of the studio. Field station is the point of connection between the forest and workshop, acting as a laboratory toolbox and stage. So there are three main components to, to the field station. So the first one being the, the rounded space frame. Um, another is the arbitrary four columns, and finally the Kulan pot acting as a cocoon for retreat underneath this room. Um, and early on, uh, so we started this project at the start of the year, in January actually, um, and we were really just exploring through one to one prototyping. Um, and there was this consistent team growth where um, these two first prototypes being around one to two square meters. Uh, then grew uh, slowly in scale for projects we were doing as 20 square meters, and finally the current uh, prototype uh, field station being roughly 90 square meters. Um, so Project for You, yes, was a huge driver for us because it gave us kind of a scenario where we could finally build. Uh, we were given a site which was the new yard in Bedford Square. Um, but of course, we wanted to make sure that before we were building something in London, we knew how to build it uh, beforehand. So um, we're considering, we were considering this as a rehearsal and simulation where we built um, the actual uh, pavilion at Hope Park. Um, and of course, the scenario was a little bit different where um, you had a lot of space, but um, part of the design and the driver. Uh, with the fact that we had to consider uh, transport for transportation. Um, so we need to make sure that we fit within a uh, pollution ban. Um, and to our surprise, uh, it actually took up very little space. Um, so we've been developing this concept of the flat piping uh, further on, uh, even though the scale keeps continuously growing. Um, and another, of course, is uh, the luxury of being in a park and having a uh, very vast uh, amount of space. And then shifting to a uh, bedroom square, um, we could use uh, a telehandler or a crane, but instead had to look for a tender solution. Uh, so here we tried uh, successfully uh, using GeneNet to be able to lift uh, the space in vertically in space, um, and then finally putting the tree forks underneath, acting as the columns. And so in that sense, it was applied choreography with slight changes, um, and we used the, the field of the first prototype of the station as this uh, pavilion for uh, the models of the previous cohort. Um, one of the, probably the strongest features of the field station is uh, considering the runwood, um, and especially just the fact that we're essentially using waste as a primary structure because um, within forestry you're considering um, any piece of branch that's below 70 millimeters is considered waste, that is, it's going to be eventually used for biofuel. Um, and for the space program itself, we're using more than 90% of it, uh, less than 70 millimeters. Um, and in the end, it's actually the most important part of the primary structure of, of the space frame. Um, but of course, within uh, a space frame scenario, there is a lot of redundancy and a lot of repetition. Um, so we had the help of either robotic developer, and he managed to develop a system with uh, 3D cameras, a vision system to scanning each and every single branch to uh, have its center line. And from the center line, we were able to cut uh, with circular saw and lathe uh, all of the 256 pieces of the rounded braces, um, and roughly taking uh, around 11 minutes per piece. Another 
aspect was uh, this conversation with Eric where we were uh, having bi weekly examinations with them um, and kind of consistent with the conversations with them through email. Um, it was interesting because it was kind of the, the engineering or the technical resolution of the project was developing at the same time as the architectural resolution and it was kind of going hand in hand at the same time. Um, and towards uh, the start of September was marking the final build stage and this was, uh, we had a huge push thanks to the help of uh, summer builds or the city schools. We had, I think, nine people that came to help us uh, in a very intense 10 days of production and, and we managed to have almost all of the components ready by the time they left. And that meant that uh, the week after for our final jury we had uh, roughly uh, some, some parts of the project started to be built, um, but um, mainly getting prepared for actually in situ assembly uh, for, for the final build. Uh, so this is a meta plot that we have for the, for the final jury. You can see the, the turtle, which is on the lower right, which was the first prototype in understandable lamination, uh, which was used for the project review. And of course, there was kind of this huge transformation in transforming this technique into an actual spatial, spatial configuration. Um, and by that point, uh, the tree forks were entirely finished, so they grew quite massively in scale compared to uh, project review and also doubled in amount. And within a span of 10 days, we were able to start building the space frame slowly but surely knowing already um, most of the choreographies that we had done with beforehand. And this was thanks to also a large amount of people who were able to help us on site, uh, both students and supervisors and professors and tutors. And finally having a little bit more of um, understanding that uh, we decided to go a little bit further into the forest. So you can see the ridge at the back is more or less where uh, the campus sits and uh, the space frame to the field station actually being in front of a path which is mostly visited by non cook residents. And, and the last week of the MNCs was actually marked by um, a lift that so finally happened after numerous delays. Um, and uh, everything was put in place and the space frame was uh, set on the three supports of the tree forks that were, as you can see, located within this triangulated uh, beams. Um, and for us, um, one, one of the, the most uh, important features are the fact that you have this now, this collaboration of groundwood uh, meeting into new timber and just uh, emphasizing the joints that kind of all, of the, these are the only pieces that actually need to be engineered to be able to uh, work together. Um, so this was a picture uh, from two days ago, uh, three days ago. Uh, so roughly 85%. Um, and finally, this was an hour ago exactly, um, <laughs> where we're finishing up with uh, the technical supports and uh, the next stage would be to put in the planks and finally the roofing sheets that you can see um, on the perimeter. And this is why we have uh, the scaffold. So that's kind of like a rough overview of the field station for now. Um, and hopefully within the next couple of weeks we'll be entirely finished with the build. Um, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you for the live, live feed. <laughs> <laughs> Trying. Um, yeah, you spent quite some time at Hook back in the day. I don't know if this is, uh, feels like a... It's a long, a long time ago, <laughs> Ingrid. Now, I'm really excited to see what you're doing there, Roman. Um, mm -hmm. I, 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 I suppose I am... Um, it just really it's making an observation about what we've seen this morning to some extent. We, we've seen mm -hmm. quite a lot of projects that are about small scale component design and mm -hmm. construction. And, and, yes. and, and I suppose I, I just wanted to ask you because 
you brought in a piece of uh, you know, something that could lift the whole lid up. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering how did that idea kind of generate? You know, because I, I it's it's not a criticism. It's just a, a, a kind of question, really, about whether whether you know whether you contemplated everything being assembled by hand. You know, because. Um, and, and, and how that comes into the thinking around uh, around um, the, the project, really. Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, I think uh, so thinking by hand, that's, that's essentially how we all uh, managed to start kind of understanding uh, the projects, understanding the materials, and understanding the, the machines with which we were working. Um, but I think at a certain stage, especially when the supply of their robotic developer came in, we were able to introduce a little bit more of this, this automation, which meant that, um, especially I think it was around the second or third prototype, we built a space ram with roughly, there was roughly four or five square meters, and that meant we had to cut around, I think, 20 uh, round wood braces, and that took an extensive amount of time. <laughs> and it, of course, it's enjoyable to a certain extent, but uh, at a certain point, yeah, it was. You know, you, you kind of realize that there is a, a decrease in the, uh, the quality of the work. And of course, that means that if the quality of the work decreases within, um, within such an important structure, then the whole bill is actually compromised. So with the robot, we, we managed to have uh, to maintain the precision and maintain the quality uh, to make sure that whatever we were building by hand, uh, which were sometimes, for example, the notches of the corals that were running through, um, that we had a little bit more uh, forgiveness in, in the things that we were building. Okay, just one other, just, just a, a question again about the materials. Was, was everything sourced on site, effectively? Yes, so um, all of the wood was sourced on site, and um, all of the metal was not. Um, but essentially, uh, we used, uh, we did the calculation recently, and it's around, we're, we're using a lot of ash, so the cores are made of ash, and, and the rounded braces are made of the beach. Um, and for the ash, we actually have a total amount of almost uh, a kilometer. Uh, so it's uh, these pieces, these cords that are uh, 80 millimeters by 30 millimeters. If you add them all up together, they, they actually very close to a kilometer in length, which is quite an interesting uh, length to, to sort of realize. <laughs> you, you, you mentioned scanning each piece and analyzing the center point of the, the components. I mean, that must take ages. I mean, how, does, how do you manage that? Yes, yeah, so the scanning this uh, was through uh, a 3D camera, so there was a vision system integrated within this camera. And in the span of roughly 30 seconds, uh, the scanner was able to detect, uh, after four movements of the robot, to detect both ends, both sides of the, the brace. Um, and actually, that was one of the quickest parts of the whole. Uh, production of each branch because uh, that the was fully automated once the script was, uh, was uh, fully developed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a sim similar comment that this morning we see in you know, this sort of logo. Uh, it seems to me it's about understanding the nature in you know, kind of uh, using the technology and you guys are doing a similar thing. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I was really impressed with this, uh, especially this uh, scanning bit. Um. It, it, I mean, just as a, I, I, when I first met you, um, you guys were making, you had made the jig to try and work this out manually, and then sort of made this transition because the labor of trying to do this with a box, with a jig, to be able to make the slots for each of these pieces was, I mean, that, that was a potentially mammoth effort. And also with the like, mixed level of, of kind of t technical skill. So uh, this was an extraordinary kind of marriage of something incredibly, you know, natural and untouched with something that was incredibly sophisticated technologically. I have a question about just the, the kind of physicality of the project. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what, what do you think about that? What, the fact that you've made it, you've, you know, we draw things and they're made elsewhere and we gather samples. As a student, you design projects and you make 
miniaturized versions of them. So what is it to be making and exhausted and thinking and engineering all at once? Mm -hmm. And how does that compare with your other experiences of architecture so far? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, super rewarding. Um, so the, the day of the left was just uh, an exciting day, I mean, kind of not necessarily in the moment, but it just it took a few days for it to, to really kick in. But um, I think just the fact that you were, I mean, the fact that we are architects and there is now this, this bridging between construction and engineering, I think it's like, it makes, makes a lot of sense to me, and I think it, shouldn't be any other way. But, um, the fact that uh, you know you, you got to, to build at a much bigger scale because you were working in a group mm. kind of shows also just the yeah just, just, just the, the potential in, of, of group work in general, right? So um, um, and I sense of pride and yes. responsibility, those things it's it's different, I'd imagine. Yeah. I, and it, and it's also just very, I think, very humbling too, because it's in the end that uh, this whole project kind of just demystified the whole process of construction, where in the end there are a lot of um, a lot of ways in which you work kind of even behind the screen or within smaller scale projects. They apply for scales of, of this size, and I think it's just it's really good just in terms of. Um, Kind of that confidence, right, in terms of uh, well, it, knowing that, uh, yeah, there's this capacity for, yeah. for growth. Because it's a real problem for architects, graduates who go into practice, because mm -hmm. some architects, in my experience of employing, kind of hit this wall, and it's actually fear of drawing details and sort of stepping beyond a certain work stage, you know, mm -hmm. very comfortable drawing and making models and mm -hmm. designing and now imaging. But very often, the, the bit that's about the making and running a contract is just like, oh my god, I don't want to do that. So I kind of love the fact that we're doing this. Could I, uh, I'm actually, I'm driving to Hook on Monday. I'm wondering if it will be, <laughs> will it be finished by Monday? There's no pressure. It's going to be really loud, so you're going to see the... Pretty much. Yeah. Can't wait. You're going to see most of it in the, in its raw stage. I also think finished is a bit of a movable piece. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's a, I mean, I was down there a couple of weeks ago, and it, it, it's really, and the structure is so extraordinary. And yeah. you look at it in detail, and you know, the way in which it's different. It's, you know, it's, it's a real study in different ways in which you can use timber. Yeah. And really low key, I mean, the use of like cable ties and, I mean, there's, there's, really, there's really sort of inventive little details that have also been resolved with the Arab. So there's a provisional aspect that I think you'll really enjoy. Yeah, I mean, if, as well as the kind of totemic quality of it sitting in the landscape, which I'm sure is amazing, um, I would love to see the joints, how you've managed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, is it mass customization or is there a kind of universal joint system? I mean, I, I guess I'll see it, but it, it, that in itself is so complex as the variations must be endless almost. Yeah. <laughs> it is. So, at, at least, uh, so there, there's been changes to the, to the development to the joints that have been made by the shoulders and notches of the rounded braces. So, in the system of the project review, it was a system that was interchangeable. So, uh, both both ends were um, symmetrical in that sense. Um, but after you know going into the final phase of construction and continuing these conversations with Arab, um, we needed to slightly tweak uh, this detail because of the fact that you needed to the angles to arrive at 45 degrees, and that meant that um, there was one end out of quite different to the other, um, and even just going to the extent of um, using the, the circular saw on within the robot pedal to be able to notch out uh, just half a sphere, uh, half a cylinder of the thread around the front sphere with, just so that you can make sure that the faces of each of yeah. the rounded braces hit each other, but at the same time have thread rods going through at the same time. So it's, it's really, uh, I mean, the amount of en the energy and commitment that's gone into making something look unengineered 
um, by scanning it and working out all these systems to there's a kind of wonderful minimalism I guess to it um, at one level but hugely energy and resource intensive <laughs> yes it's yeah, very very discreet um, and very um, very advanced <laughs> I had, I had a question like how much was this possible because you built on the knowledge of previous kind of buildings and pavilions that were done at Hook Park. Like I, I saw there was like a fork building that was done before. Mm -hmm. It was quite interesting how yes. it kind of mixed different innovations or like for example, the, I don't know if the 3D scanning had been done before and this was allowed because someone had already had a stab at it once and so I don't know if that's the case or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so actually most of, if not all of the space frame was uh, prototyped from, from this year. Uh, so this, is, this has been a new, uh, a new kind of um, idea to, to be brought into. It was, it was given by the tutors as a brief uh, initiative. Um, and the, even just the vision system uh, has been developed in the end. Roughly during this time, actually. So very, very much novel things that we've been exposed to and that we've been working with. Um, and I think that's why we're always just considering these things prototypes because now we've managed to, okay, we've managed to build something that's roughly 90 square meters, but in the end it's, uh, it's one prototype that's hoping to be continued further on uh, because there is just so much uh, potential for it. Are you going to test uh, how thin you can use? Um, probably not anymore, but actually that's an interesting way to, um, to look at it. Uh, so with, with the conversations of, of Arab, when we have this uh, specific um, plan where it's just showing where each, within each round of ground race, they need to have a specific uh, diameter because they're exposed to different kind of horses uh, relating to uh, the points where the supports are, the tree points. So that's already giving us an indication of how much the wood is working, but also just an indication of how far we're trying to push uh, the technical aspects of the project. Um, because it's also, at the same time, the, the diameter of the ground is a really important, but uh, the fact that we try to push as much as possible to have as little supports uh, coming in contact with the space frame. So we really only have three points of contact, um, and the overhangs are pretty extensive. And um, and this was all accounted for with, with this conversation with Eric. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's it's trying to push it as much as possible uh, in the limits of trying to also um, not uh, destroy huge amount of work. <laughs> I guess that's one of the, the great things about learning through making, which you're doing. You can understand the limitations of, of the of details that you've drawn and you've engineered, and then actually the, the characteristics of it when you build. So I think that's almost what I find of what is so exciting about what you're doing. It must smell mm -hmm. amazing when you're in there. And I love that yep. image of being in this sort of tree yeah, I think the snow kind of ran away now, but uh, the new cohort has been, uh, they've been making some software so that we can just smell the cedar inside the oh, workshop and yeah. it smells amazing. Yeah. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> super quick question, super, super fast. I'm just wondering, like, uh, is there, um, maybe this is, like, is there, uh, like, intellectual property that you can have Is there other talks about, like, the scanning of the stake, of the, uh, of, like, the scanning kind of center and the minimum kind of circumference? I'm sorry, did, did you Oh, sorry. I'm just wondering if there's something that, uh, if there's kind of intellectual property that comes out of this effort, right? Is there, is there a conversation about who, about proprietary technologies that you're developing and, and who owns those technologies? Yeah.
meeting point, we're actually just in the process of starting to put together these uh, wood lab books, which then document um, the structures at Hook Park and their history, which is, I think, you know, for John Makepeace, who's been so instrumental in the, in the kind of the gift of the, of the site, the whole point is to show the world what's possible with timber, um, with obviously a view to uh, confronting climate crisis. So I think it's, you know, the dissemination of knowledge is, is really, really critical. And it's, I think that the iterations that you go through and the kind of prototyping that happens and the visibility ad hoc of all of these models, both that are models, but also structures and an integral part of the site themselves is, it's a really interesting test bed for how we understand architectural education more generally. Um, it's so, I'm so happy that we got to get you in. I'm sorry, I have to see some strong arm to you. Into, I'm sure that you probably need it back, in, back on site, but I think it's a really good moment to also gather a few comments from those who can't be joining us this afternoon. Um, if there's anything you wanted to, to comment on more generally. I mean, I, I just to reiterate, I mean, I, I, it's been a great morning, actually. Thank Fantastic you. work. I mean, including the first year students such sophistication but but I, I just wanted to make the comment I, I really it, it's you know just wanted to maybe it's a question to to, to mark and you I mean uh, you know are we are we part of a, a sort of quiet revolution at the AA in terms of this focus on the relative small scale you know the, the handmade the hands-on and and how that might be procured you know I mean it's, I mean, it's, a, it's a question that really intrigues me yeah Point. I, I, I like this idea of challenging realness. I think that you know, actually, the highly speculative as a reality, and the highly pragmatic as a, a level of invention. So you know, I think that there's a one is not more valuable than the other within the profession, and there's different modes of iteration, whether that be with clouds or with timidity. So it's, a, it's an exciting moment, but with a, with a weight of responsibility. This presentation, you spoke with utter assurance and tons of knowledge. And I just, first, mostly looked at drawings and models and videos and cinema. What I've also been picking up on is how much our students can own their work, talk about it in this space, take this, the curved question, and, and I think integrate a kind of larger discourse. So that's another maybe really quiet revolution at the school is how are we communicating the work. You could have been on the radio, and most of what <laughs> we've taken away could have been transferred. So it's a real art to that, but I also think it's based on a, on a strong gap of knowledge. So I, I think the value of actually looking at current work or work done in the last cycle is also to, to see how we are more and more clear about stating our purpose and our stance mm -hmm. and fielding those questions. So it's been a great one. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not here this afternoon, but I think I, I don't know very much about the AA at all, actually, so it was really good to see the range of projects presented. But I have always thought of the AA as a very strong research based school, and that's been evidenced today. And I, I think the question that I'm walking away with is now that you're dealing with climate change, and that's come up a lot, you, you're, you're able to, all of your students have shown skills in model making, digital work, hand making things, projects, one-to-one, -one. and I, I just really want to know how we're really going to push that out there and make it meaningful, because I think things need to change quickly, and as we're also talking about how we make the change quickly, we seem to be so engaged and able to do that, and I put my things up. I think someone said to me the other day, it was, it was really about 15 years. That's kind of what we've got to mm -hmm. make a very big something difference. This question of research, you know, I come from a sort of a university background of research as a specific definition, a specific mode of dissemination. Actually, we're sitting the other day as this meeting, and really what we're supposed to be doing is developing new knowledge. Mm -hmm avenues of inquiry, asking questions, and disseminating that knowledge and, that, and those questions in the best way which we can. And actually, research cultures have not really succeeded in doing that in the traditional format. So there's something, something very healthy at the AA of not being bothered with what peer review, 
but actually having a conversation. I think the priority is now to have a conversation outside this room um, and to make sure that that we're serious about what we want to have that conversation with, that we treat that with a degree of urgency um, and humility. And it's not humor, it's not occasion for people that need it. Um, and that's, that, that's very exciting for me. <laughs> well, I really enjoyed this point. I mean, I haven't, um, I mean, I've done many reviews here, but I enjoy this moment of reflection. You know, it's quite brave actually for a school to say, look, this is what we were doing last year. Not now, and we're not going to change it. We're on track, so we're going to get everyone through it. And I think the last two or three years in education have been very difficult for your generation and being at home and not being in the studio culture. And it's great seeing Hook. Um, you know, people building, making together collaboratively um, a new kind of school, and it's, it's going to be really exciting to see. I think it's also refreshing this morning because I sometimes think some projects as a union as units that think they can politically change the world or sort of technology, which isn't research today, it's more sort of being provocative about an idea. And I think actually the is an opportunity now to have this kind of involved research, which is about some of the things we saw this morning. The food and mill um, projects like housing rural communities, people within the city, you know, place making identity through materials. So it's really refreshing to see that range and look forward to seeing what 2022 call up is. I thought it was really interesting to end with Hook for two reasons. The first being that, as you say, the majority of well, all of work bar Hook was work in the past, but it's very much in the present for Hook. But uh, I guess coming back to Ingrid's earlier point, this, the scope of the earlier projects was still quite wide, whether it was um, resolutely within a kind of social agenda or a technological agenda or whatever, whereas it was it's super clear by nature of Hook the parameters that it works within. And I thought that was really refreshing and really clear. So maybe there's some transferability in that that starting to put the parameters, not to say things get canceled out, but the kind of specificity was really nice. Thanks. Uh, yes, so yeah, I, I wasn't quite sure what to expect to see this morning. So yeah, I didn't sort of, yeah, sh share the same. Um, in the comment with others, really refreshing to to know that actually, you know, a lot of concerns about resources and materials and construction, which is, I don't know, perhaps that was also other unit dealing with other stuff, perhaps, but uh, that's, that seems to me the majority of the kind of uh, themes that you guys are dealing with. And uh, yeah, so ending this morning with Hook is, uh, you know, appropriate. In some way, and uh, yeah, especially you guys are dealing with that in in in, in a real time, you know, the one to one with uh, heavy things, lifting and carrying and chopping. So yeah, that's how how you run things. So yeah, well done. Climate change to everything. Full on. Full on. It was just really lovely to see all the projects. And it's just such a broad range of interests. I don't have much else to add. <laughs> but I mean, just one other comment, given the comment I made earlier. I, I suppose the challenge is, you know, about how we and whether these approaches become more mainstream and whether we can, you know, in practice, you know, we, we are always contending with methods of procurement that are really detrimental to how places are made and buildings are built and, you know, environments. So I, I just, I think, you know, that's why I think, you know, one needs to also find a, a way of, you know, Change. Talking about that, you know. Well, I, I just thank you so much. I mean, it was, a, it was obviously a, also a wonderful range of people to have in the room, from very, very different pr practical 